community who cause us to consider our neighborhood to be global in geography, encompassing women and men, children and youth who are different from us, including people whose traditions and beliefs, politics and opinions do not match those we hold and defend. Such variety enriches our lives and liberates us from our too small vision. How glad we are for the generations that have preceded our own, for ancestors who have struggled to provide a solid foundation upon which we now build, not for ourselves only, but for all who will follow. Challenge us, O source of reconciliation, to come to know others, never as enemies, but always as part of the human family, seeking to live well while doing good. May your creating spirit bless us so that we might bless others. And may we continue to give thanks, not in this season only, but always. We pray to the Holy that is present with and in us all. Amen. May we have your report, please. The agenda for the November 5th, 2019 uh, regular meeting of the Glendale City Council was posted on Thursday, October 31, 2019 on the bulletin board outside City Hall. Thank you. What's the next item? 3A is agenda preview for the meetings of Tuesday, November 12, 2019. Thank you. Mr. Galanya. Yes, good evening, Mr. Mayor, Member of City Council. The regular Housing Authority and City Council meetings for November 12, 2019 have been canceled. Next regular meetings are scheduled for November 19, 2019. Thank you, Thank Mr. Mayor. Thank you. And the next item. Next item is 3B, Mayor's Commendation to Glendale Police Officer Ryan and Salako. Officer and Salako and Chief, accompanied by our Chief. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Carl Povolatis, Police Chief. You know, I've come before you many, many times and I tell you that we aim to hire the uh, best and the brightest. Um, and that's exactly what we do. And it's my privilege tonight to be able to introduce Officer Ryan in Slaco, who, you know, as we spend a lot of time talking about traffic, truly has a passion for police work and has a passion for traffic. Um, Ryan is one of those who, who averages about 30 traffic stops and get this, 13 drunk driving arrests every single month. In 2018, he actually made 60 arrests for driving under the influence. And for those of us that have been in police work, that's a lot of driving under the influence arrests. And he was honored by Mothers Against Drug Driving last year uh, with one of their campaign ribbons for, for his work. But I gotta tell you, this is one of the people who is absolutely tireless uh, in his approach to protecting our community uh, and getting drunk drivers off the road because he's outdone 2018. He's already had 120 arrests for 2019, and so he's moving up into that into that uh, into that next tier. I got to tell you, we were very lucky. Uh, we uh, stole him from San Diego, um, and you know the other part is is like you know police work sometimes runs in families, and in this case, he happens to be the son of Sergeant Ron Insalaco, who is re a retired Glendale police officer. So I got to tell you, I couldn't be prouder than to present uh, Officer Ryan Insalaco for uh, for a commendation for his hard work in protecting the community. Of Glendale. Thank you. That deserves a round of applause. <laughs> Officer, I'm uh, proud to read a commendation uh, which I will ask uh, Councilman Quintero to uh, deliver to you. Uh, it's presented to you, Officer Ryan Insalaco of the Glendale Police Department, in recognition of your DUI enforcement efforts and in receiving the top DUI Enforcer Award from MAD. The over 100 DUI arrests that you've made have potentially saved hundreds of lives and kept our community safe. I commend your commitment in making sure drivers under the influence are kept off the road. On behalf of the City of Glendale, we thank you for your admirable service and commitment to the betterment of our community. I ask the uh, mayor to uh, let me shake your hand and present it to you. Uh, his father and it looks like his mom are in the uh, 
are in the audience. I've known his father for many years, and uh, he served this community for so long in multiple roles, has unbelievable experiences uh, working in law enforcement here in Glendale and throughout Southern California. So it's an honor to present it to Ron's son. Thank you, sir. And would you like to address the city? Officer? Yes, sir. Uh, Mayor, city council members, I want to thank you for recognizing our patrol team with this award. Chief Povolitis, Captain Feely, Lieutenant Darby, Sergeant Metz, and Sergeant Krivak have made it very clear that drunk driving enforcement is a significant priority within our department. As a team, we will continue our proactive drunk driving enforcement efforts to keep our roads safe and keep our community safe. Thank you again. Thank you. Don't drink and drive in London. That's for sure. Anywhere. Um, Especially in London. Next item, please. Receives appointment of board and commission member uh, for the Arts and Culture Commission. <coughs> it is the appointment of Jane Vire. Uh, this was a nomination made by Council Member Garpetian on October 22nd, 2019. Mr. Garpetian. <coughs> yes, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I believe Ms. Vire is here in the audience as well. Uh, I nominated her because she's been very involved in our community, and I think she's going to do a great job in, in this commission. Uh, she's part of our Glendale Library Foundation already. She's the vice president, Brand Associates, Glendale Police Foundation, uh, Committee for a Clean and Beautiful Glendale, Love My Neighborhood Poster Contest. She's been very involved. So I want to, uh, I'm going to move the, the item, but before that, I would like to, she also has, you know, let me just go over her education as well. Uh, Georgia State University uh, degree in Spanish, uh, Western Illinois uh, degree in speech, language, pathology, and the list goes on and on and on. And I want to ask uh, Jane if she would like to say a few words. You don't have to, but you, the floor is all yours if you like to. Okay. Um, good evening, Mayor Najarian and Honorable Council members, I just want to thank you, particularly um, Councilman Garpetian, for the uh, nomination, and I hope the rest of you for um, uh, for approving the um, appointment. And uh, I, ha I am um, I enthusiastically um, applaud the idea of Glendale as an arts destination, and so I'm very much looking forward to working. With, um, with the other commissioners and with Dr. Schaefer and the very capable library arts and culture staff members and you all um, in pursuit of that objective. So again, thank you very much. I'm honored for the appointment. Very nice, welcome. I, with that, I move the, I move the item. Second, seconded by uh, Ms. Ragajanian. Roll call, please. Council Member Agajanian? Yes. Devine? Yes. Garpedian? Yes. Quintero? Yes. Mayor Najarian? Yes. <coughs> Congratulations. Mrs. Byer. Welcome. <laughs> next item, please. 3D is a presentation by the Chief of Police. Chief. We're going to see how technologically proficient I am. Mr. Mayor, uh, members of council, Carl Polvitis, police chief. Uh, I thought I would take just a, a moment to talk about traffic enforcement and sort of the, or, or the Glendale Police Department's approach to traffic enforcement and how we deploy our, uh, our resources to, to address a variety of issues. And I know that's an issue uh, that, you know, is a constant issue for community concern and questions and I know for, uh, for all of you. So uh, I'll start off by saying that what we do is we use very much a, uh, a data-driven approach. And so we're, we're looking at our traffic collisions, uh, places where people get hurt driving, driving vehicles where we have cars actually uh, get into crashes. Uh, we look at our complaints in terms of our quality of life. We look at our main corridors and we also look at our schools. And what we do is we aim to most efficiently deploy the resources that we have. Currently, our traffic bureau consists of nine motors and three traffic cars. Those are 12 people who are dedicated to their primary uh, function being traffic. 
but I think something that's a little bit unique to Glendale uh, with the transition of parking enforcement to, uh, to a vendor, one of the things that we've been able to do is we've taken the remaining people that used to primarily do parking enforcement and we have shifted their role significantly to assist us in, in the realm of, of traffic and parking. And they have taken over some of the responsibilities for some of the schools. And what's, I think, if you will, kind of cool about that is that they have taken ownership of this and so some of the things that have been challenges and head scratchers for schools and administrators, uh, some of our, our uh, police services officers have been out and looked at those schools and said, you know, we can make this a little better. We'll change the cone pattern. We'll do a little bit of different traffic control just to ease that, which has then allowed us to relieve, if you will, pressure uh, or workload on our remaining traffic officers so that they can go to work within the city. But I also want to emphasize one other thing uh, that starting especially in 2018, traffic enforcement has become a department-wide effort. It is not just the responsibility of the Traffic Bureau and the officers assigned there to address traffic-related issues. It is also the responsibility of every patrol officer, every field enforcement officer that is out there to, to work on, on that. So part of what we look at, because what we want to do is we want to be in the places that we need to be in, and there's a balance between uh, a, what I'll call a preventive presence uh, based on some of the quality of life information we have, but also looking at our, at our, at our traffic collisions. So if you kind of look at the city, this is one of the heat maps that we look at. Uh, the darker colors are where collisions tend to concentrate. You'll kind of get a sense of where it is, and primarily uh, into the downtown area, the area around the freeways is the area that we're going to move some of our resources. I've also given you sort of a five-year look at our traffic collisions, and so you can see that we've been hovering in the 2014-2015 at about 2,500 traffic collisions per year. That dropped a little bit into 2016 and 17 and 18, and we're on track for about uh, 2,200 or so traffic collisions this year. And so part of wanting to make things better in Glendale is trying to reduce and, and eliminate traffic collisions in the process. This is not a static thing. We don't only look at this annually. Uh, one of the things that the, the traffic uh, lieutenant looks at on a regular basis is they're going to look at traffic collisions. And so just to give you a, a look at a 14-day period, a little bit of a snapshot, we look at this. This goes into the mix on how we deploy our, our resources. Um, the next thing that we look at is all the phone calls that we get where people have issues or concerns in the community, the requests for service that we get. On average, we, we get about five of these a day from various people. And it could be a stop sign, it could be speed, uh, it could be bicycle related, uh, it can be any one of those issues. Those come into the traffic bureau. We add that to the mix and look at that. So as I said, that's about 1,300 requests a year that we get for, for directed enforcement. And so part of what the, uh, the traffic bureau will do is they will look at the data, they will look at those complaints, and they will start to develop a deployment matrix so that we know where to send people and when to send people. One of the other pieces that we add into that is we look at our heavily, our more heavily trafficked corridors uh, in terms of vehicle counts. Uh, and that sometimes lines up with where the traffic collisions. And I have not given you an, ex an extent and a, a complete list of all of them in, in Glendale, but some of the places that we look on a regular basis uh, is looking at the Glendale corridor, looking at the Verdugo <coughs> corridor, uh, Chevy Chase and Chevy Chase Cannon Corner corridor, and then over at Glen Oaks and Kenneth. Those two, you know, not only generate complaints, but there's a lot of cars that move on those. And so two things will happen. Some of these are set up for directed enforcement, where we put people out and assign them for a specific period of time uh, to work that. But we also, we also ask, especially for our traffic cars, that if they aren't assigned to a different area, if based on the mix of collisions, uh, quality of life complaints, um, if they're not specifically assigned to something, that they spend some time on, on these particular, particular areas. But again, we'll also assign them out uh, uh, as a directed enforcement to work a few hours or a day in a particular area to make, a, to make an impact with, uh, with traffic. So in order just to kind of also get a sense of you know, where the traffic collisions are, where the complaints are, we also take a look at our, at our traffic stops and see how, that, how they're lining up against what we've asked folks to do and where they are. And so you can kind of get a sense for a 14-day period. Some of it's in South Glendale, some of it's out in West Glendale, some of it is up in the canyon, some of it is up in the Montrose La Crescenta area, and they kind of group into that thing. So we're constantly analyzing this data, again, with the goal of being efficient and effective with uh, the deployment of our resources. So we are where we're needed to be and not where maybe we don't need to be uh, and, and not being somewhere where if we were, we would be a little bit more effective in, in going forward. As I said, for, for those who uh, don't think we write traffic citations, we do. 
Uh, this gives you a little bit of a sense looking back through 2014. Um, back then we wrote 19,000 sites a year. It dropped off a little in the intervening years. You'll see in 2017 and 18, uh, the emphasis on traffic enforcement has come back. Last year, just under 19,000 people received traffic citations from the Glendale Police Department. And the 2019 number is just through September. So it looks like we're on track for about 20,000 citations. Now, that's compared against we make about 26,000 traffic stops per year uh, when, when, all is, when all is said and done. So we are out working on those enforcement said it. Part of it is, for us, again, is getting enforcement into the, into the right areas. Just to give you a sense of a couple of the operations, again, this is not uh, all inclusive, but just to give you an idea, uh, back on November 1, we had a couple of folks working up uh, in the evening hours uh, in Chevy Chase Canyon. They wrote 14 speeding tickets, some stop sign tickets, uh, impeding traffic, uh, one for being under the influence of, of marijuana. And this is just one of sort of the rotation of operations that we do throughout the year. We've also been out on the uh, northwest side uh, working on Countess Village. This was a daytime operation. Uh, you can kind of get a sense there of the citations that officers were, were writing in the Kenneth Village. So if you kind of think of north of Glen Oaks in that area, some of the, some of the places where we've had quality of, uh, quality of life issues. We also work areas such as Adams Hill. We'll work the brand and central corridors. So as I said, this is not meant to be exclusive. It's really to give you an example of how we deploy our resources to be effective uh, to be, to, to be effective with them. Um, I think as, as, we, as we go on, we're always looking for ways to work smarter. One of the commitments uh, that the organization has is to continual improvement. And so every time we rotate a manager, every time something comes out, we ask that they build on what came before and we look for better ways to do things. I think some of the, the things that we do to try and make sure that we're in the right place at the right time, sometimes when we get the complaints that there is speed and we can't narrow it down, we have some volunteers who will actually go out, they will take a radar gun, they will run a log, um, and then they will write down the speed. There was one I was looking in on the other day up at the top of Chevy Chase Canyon where there were some complaints, complaints of speed. We sent them up. The speed limit was actually posted at 30. The average speed was actually just under 30. There was one that was over 30, and that was a, 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 a look at about 50 cars going through. So that helps us. I think one of the more exciting things for us is the speed radar signs that Public Works has put in, the new ones. Uh, capture that data. Some of the old ones capture the data, but you had to go wire in to do it. The new ones will wirelessly transmit, transmit that to us so we can look at day of week, time of day, and the speeds. Um, having been a traffic bureau commander at one point, I know that it's like looking at Chevy Chase Canyon, I'm used to getting the phone calls, and we would send people out during sort of morning and afternoon. Well, when we looked at the data, morning and afternoons, everybody slowed down to 25. They knew, they knew they were out there and traffic was heavier. What we saw was the speeds were higher in the afternoon. So we shifted our deployment to be there when, when the speeds would pick up on the cut through traffic. So I think that's going to be uh, some exciting things to, that we'll be looking forward. I think the last thing, just as uh, a comment, it's like I've run a, a study every now and again uh, just to see where the people we cite, where they come from. And so it doesn't matter sort of how we draw the border. We'll draw it around a neighborhood. We'll draw it around the city plus or minus five points, half the people we cite are from the city of Glendale. And so, you know, there's, again, looking at one of the direct enforcement operations doing the officer said back, a lot of the people that we were writing cites and issuing warnings to live in the same neighborhood from where we're getting the complaints. And so, you know, when I look at some of the traffic collisions and I look at some of the tragedies going, look, this is our community. The police department is here to do part of it, but this is our community. This is us driving in our community. It's us walking in our community. It is our kids that are driving the cars, our grandkids, our relatives. And so I'm going to ask everybody when we look at these things, it's like, take that time, you know, if you have kids, do you know how your kids are driving the car? Please make sure we are watching out for each other. We can argue the legalities till the cows come home, and sometimes I leave that to the attorneys as to who is at fault. But a lot of collisions are preventable if we're watching out for each other. And with that, I'll answer any questions. Questions? Mr. Agajanian? On, uh, there's no page number, but I have a citations 2014 to 2019 citywide. No? Citations? You're right. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Uh, 2014, it says 19,411. Then 2015, 16, it came to 15,000, and then started going up. Did you 
study or somebody in your department studied how this can happen. We go from 2014 to 2016, whether it has been written less ticket or people, there were drivers, they were behaving themselves or you didn't have the uh, enough officers to give tickets and now we are going back to where we were in 2014. What should be the reason? We have, as I've explained, we have put an emphasis on traffic enforcement and we're putting that emphasis department wide. So yes, we have looked at, the, we actually do look at the data. So generally, again, rough numbers, half of the citations written in the police department will be written by the traffic bureau. That's about half because that is their primary job. The other half will be written by patrol officers because patrol officers are also pulled in a bunch of different directions. They are handling all of the 911 calls, all of the other calls for service that are, that are non-traffic related. And so there was a point where our staffing levels had dropped a little bit um, and our calls for service had gone up and so our traffic enforcement gone down. Starting back in 2018, traffic became a department-wide priority. It is one of our top four priorities for the, for the department. So it's not just the responsibility of the traffic bureau to do enforcement, it's a responsibility for all patrol officers to do traffic enforcement in addition to what they normally do. Thank you. And if I can add to that, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, when, when Chief Povolitis was hired uh, in April of 2018, uh, one of the things that we talked about and, and his goal was good old-fashioned police work. And good old-fashioned police work has to do with the basics that include traffic enforcement. And that is one of his four pillars to make sure that overall the department is focusing uh, on this issue that we all see on a daily basis and, and feel in terms of what happens on our streets. Thank you. Mr. Vine. Um, I appreciate uh, everything that you're doing and the, the you know the data that you're um, that you're accumulating and the way the matrix that you're using for putting patrol officers and motorcyclists out there, but still the perception remains in our community that the that there is not enough. I'm not saying there isn't any. There is not enough enforcement. Um, people are complaining about trucks going on our our, our cut through streets like Mountain in the morning, uh, there's speeding and, and all of the traffic violations that we can, uh, we can think of. Uh, there is that perception. I hear it all the time. I'm sure my fellow council members, uh, I, I would imagine that they would agree with me that we hear that. Um, my question to you is, um, how can we, what suggestions would you have for a more focused enforcement? You know, we're the ninth safest city in the state and in the country. And that's because we put an emphasis on um, crime, enforcement on crime, those 9-11 calls, the breaking and entrings, et cetera. And, you, and the, 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 um, the mantra is uh, the thieves don't come or the, 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 those that are going to be um, breaking into our homes don't come to Glendale because they know they're going to get arrested. I'd like to see that become the mantra for enforcement that people are not going to run through a stop sign because there's going to be somebody there giving them a ticket. They're not going to speed on, a, on a, uh, our streets because someone's going to be there to enforce. I, it just seems like we've reached a point now. Um, 2014, we had, on, we had almost 20,000 uh, citations. Right now, we're at 15. I, I don't know if we're going to reach 20,000. We should probably, at this stage of the game, be reaching 25,000 the way it seems to be going out there. We have more speeding, we have more violations, we have more people running through stop signs. I almost was killed on Louise and Stalker. Um, you know, so just the woman just ran the stop sign. I was in the, practically in the middle of the intersection. And it, it just seems like this, the, you know, we've done education, we all know the three E's, education, engineering, enforcement. Education isn't working. Engineering, tonight we're gonna spend a fortune on engineering, on our streets. That's not working. It's the enforcement part of this 3E that just doesn't seem to be, be working. And I just would like to, you know, I, I, I'm just looking for ideas. I mean, do we, can we do a, a special traffic enforcement 
detail, like a special that, that roams or uh, roams around the city um, uh, from place to place every day and not necessarily um, these particular, you know, on Central Brand of Glen Oaks, but, you know, on our on Kenneth and uh, some of the, the smaller streets that have s stop signs and um, I don't know what the answer is. That's why I'm asking, you know, maybe we need a staff report or some kind of a, um, maybe my colleagues would agree, a report on what we what can be done to increase enforcement. Do we need more officers? Do we need more uh, patrol uh, officers on bikes, on motorcycles, or in the cars? Or, you know, what do we need? What, how can we solve this problem before it gets, I mean, right now I, I just feel like it's a, we're at a critical stage where there's just so much going on. And um, it, it just seems like, um, um, you know, I know you're trying to do the best you can with what, you, what you're dealing with, the number of officers you have. I know that. Um, I tell people all the time that you're doing the best that you can, but I think we have to do better. And so what I'd like is um, some sort of a report or um, suggestions on how we can improve and, and get a really uh, focused traffic enforcement uh, detail of some sort. So I can tell you we do focus on it. And although I haven't put everything up here, we do rotate around the city. And those 1,300 complaints that come in every year, we actually do pay attention to. They go on the matrix for us to go. Sometimes we go up and we find that there's nothing, that, that there's nothing there, that an officer can spend three or four hours at a particular place and not have the violation uh, that's, that's been reported. So that's why I said we mix this data together to focus in where our traffic collisions are because that's where people ultimately get hurt. Uh, then we focus in there. We take our OTS money and then focus, focus those into, into various areas. And then we said we do move it around the, around the city in order to be effective with, with what we have. Uh, the citation numbers for 2019 are actually through September, so that's the first three quarters. So it hasn't caught up with October or November yet, and that should track us at, at about 20,000 citations per year. I don't want to remove all discretion from a police officer uh, because I think most people who get stopped, it's like, okay, we get stopped. It's like at some point there is sometimes the point where you do want to give someone uh, the opportunity to have, a, to have a break, that maybe the citation is not the, the most, uh, most important. It's like most of the times when I stop somebody, they get a break. Uh, however, somebody did get a cite the other day. Well, when you cut me off and then run a red light, you get a citation. Well, I, I, I think you should be giving citations for everybody that deserves it. But I think this is kind of like the, um, uh, what, what the, the economy or, or inflation. You know, we should be giving far more tickets now than we did in 2018 or 2014. We have more cars. We have more people driving. We have more kids. Everything has, in, our population is, is, you know, is increasing. Younger people are driving. Uh, we, we see a, a change in, in this. And so I, I just feel like our, the, the citations should be much more than this, much more than 15 or 20,000. Um, so I, I'm, I'm just looking for, um, like I say, if one of my colleagues would, would um, agree with me and, and ask for some sort of a report with suggestions or um, some sort of implementation idea for a, a, a focused police enforcement. People need to know that you're out there, and right now they don't know that. They, I hear it all the time. I, and I guess, I mean, if I can chime in, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, and, and fully understanding the frustrations of, of folks in different neighborhoods who experience uh, traffic issues uh, related to speeding, uh, going through stop signs, uh, et cetera, you know, as, as we often ourselves may be driving, you know, I've, I've heard my parents say at different times when, when somebody cuts them off, where's the cop when you need them? Well, we can't have a cop at every corner, as, as you can imagine. It'd be nice uh, for us to have that opportunity and ability to, to have enough staffing and resources uh, to have more folks uh, out there. Um, but in terms of the directed enforcement piece, um, and again, this was just a, a snapshot uh, that the chief shared with you today. Uh, that snapshot of directed enforcement, um, whether it's 
DUI saturation, whether it's traffic enforcement, whether it's patrol officers going about their routine work that they do on a daily basis, traffic enforcement, as the chief said, is, is one of uh, the areas of focus for the department. And so the department is focusing on it. Are there other ideas that are out there that are possible? By all means, if, if there are ideas, we're always open uh, to hearing those ideas. But to say that we don't have a directed enforcement strategy in place uh, today is, is an inaccurate. We, we actually do. It may not be enough for certain areas. It may not be at the exact time where an infraction is occurring, um, but that is in place today. Mr. Garbettian. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. <coughs> A couple of quick questions. Uh, this 15, how many people, do we have the number as to how many people in, in the city drive? Is it like, we, our population is 200,000, so 206,000. Uh, so if half of them drive or 80 percent, I think about 60, 70,000 drive, I don't think everybody, considering the kids and everything else. So if it's 60,000, 70,000 people driving in our city, uh, 15,000 is about, what, 25% of it? Pretty much, maybe maybe 20%. Am I correct? 25. 25%. So the number of the citations, do we have a breakdown uh, of what kind of citations were they? Are they, were they reckless drivers? Were they uh, speeding? Were they red light, as you mentioned? Is it is it broken down, or it's more like, in general, we have one you know, drag racing, we hear, hear a lot about, you know, people racing on the streets or what have you. Yeah, I mean, uh, the probably the three top complaints that I hear is <coughs> usually speed. Um, and, and speed sometimes, unfortunately, can be a little bit deceptive because if you're on a narrow street, it's like I'll even look on, on the street I live, you got cars on both sides, somebody comes up and you go, yeah, that car seems to be moving fast. When I really look at it, it's going 25 or less. Uh, sometimes our motor officers will actually take the time to look to sit with somebody and go, okay, how fast do you think the car is going? And they'll say 30 or 40 and pop it up and it's 22, 25, 27 in that there. So some of it depends on how wide the street, how narrow the street. Yes, we can break down it as what we do usually when we go into an area is we work several things. So we will work speed. Um, we get a lot of complaints about modified exhaust, so we will work modified exhaust. Uh, that's become more challenging because uh, probably the day that I grew up, on you, yeah, yeah, you actually had to cut the muffler out and put in a glass pack or put something else, and so it was a permanent thing. Now the newer cars have a button that allows you to go into what they call a track mode, which will move a couple of baffles and bypass the muffler, which just adds to the, if you will, maybe the frustration for police officers when you're trying to trying to 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 work on that. And as I said, we also focus on some of the equipment violations like tinted windows, because as we look at our pedestrian violations, uh, you know, we talk about being able to make eye contact with a pedestrian, and this is one of those things where it's like, don't step off the road unless the driver sees you, and you know, looking at drivers, make sure you're looking for the pedestrian. Well, you got to be able to see in and out of the window in order for them to do that. So we focus on all of those, and so you'll see a mix of, of what I'll call well-rounded enforcement. It's not just speed. It is also all of those equipment violations, turning violations, red light violations. Um, Chief, thank you for coming forward. Um, I've seen what's going on in the community, and I think that the police department has been unfairly criticized in certain uh, neighborhood publications and on certain neighborhood media uh, posts. Um, you come to us every year for your budget. There's no doubt in my mind that you would, budget permitting, ask for us to double your police force. But the harsh reality of a municipal government is we can't do that. We ask you to do more with less. Uh, and we have less officers per thousand uh, residents than our neighbors, Burbank, Pasadena, way Sorry. less than Los Angeles does. Um, I certainly appreciate uh, the work that, that you do. I don't want there to be a quota system. Um, I think saying that you've got to hit 15,000 or 20,000 citations is wrong. That's not what we're about. Um, I do want the officers to have discretion. Uh, the ultimate goal is to provide a safer roadway for all of us and for people to learn. And if that means, in certain circumstances, for an officer to give a warning, uh, perhaps a strict warning, nonetheless, I'm okay with that. Um, and we don't have a quota system for advancement, for promotion. Um, uh, uh, 
uh, Ryan Insalaco's uh, award uh, had nothing to do with his promotion, it had to do with hard work uh, and training in arresting those over, I think he's up to 120 DUIs. So um, uh, I feel for you. We're, you know, we're asking you to do many things, but we have one of your hands tied behind your back. We do have to balance our, our needs in the city. Um, I know that you do have the targeted enforcement. You've got um, divisions and data crunchers that will show where to go and, uh, and find these scoff laws. And it's not just traffic issues we have. I wish our only issue in the city of Glendale were speeders, but we do have other issues. We've got gangs around the city. We've got burglaries going up. We've got the, uh, the diabolical combination of AB 107 and Prop, prop 47, prop 47, 57, 57. Uh, we've got drug use on the increase with the marijuana being uh, legalized. Come to us, if I'm not sure what, what Ms. Um, Devine was asking for specifically, but I think it's along these lines. Please come back to us, let us know what we can do for you, whether it's in terms of grant funding, whether it's in terms of education. I mean, it really bothered me, I have to say this, I'm not gonna name the, the uh, the neighborhood association, but rather than criticize the police department saying, that, oh, we're not fully staffed with motor officers or we feel unsafe, there should have been a paragraph saying, we are the residents of this community. Uh, we are the enemy and uh, I've met the enemy and it is us, to quote the Pogo <laughs> thing. So let us know what we can do to make your officers, and not just in traffic, traffic's very important, that's what everyone sees. We don't see the break-ins necessarily. We see that crazy kid zipping down the street in the, in the Hellcat uh, charger. Um, a lot of it has to do with money, obviously, uh, but if there's anything we can do, if it's including money, uh, please let us know. And if that's the request, I would, if you don't mind, coming back to us with some thoughts on how we can better assist you and your department to better police our city in yeah. all aspects. And, and Mayor, Ms. Devine. Um, first of all, I want to make the point that I'm not criticizing the police department. And number two, neither do have any of the people that I've talked to, the residents that I've talked to, criticized the police department. They are saying, do we need more police officers? We need more enforcement. We need to see more of them out there. They're not, it's, it's not a criticism against you. It, it's exactly what the mayor is saying. And I'm saying, come to us. Can you give us suggestions on how we can do this, how we can bring about this enforcement, how we can bring about this perception to the community that you are out there? Let us help you with that. Um, and um, so thank you, Mayor, for, uh, for um, oh, we'll, reiterating that. We'll, uh, so we'll we, ask you we, to we help us We will certainly keep that. you apprised. To say help we are, us help you, we, Chief. We are, we are looking at a couple of different things. You will see, uh, I think I probably neglected a message in the, it mentioned in the first part of the presentation, is we're looking at what I'm just going to call some off-peak enforcement. So in some times that you might not normally see enforcement. So with the resources that we have, we are actually looking at going, okay, you know, do we need to cover some of the evening hours? And if you looked carefully at one of those slides, it was an evening, it was an evening enforcement. And that's something we are looking at. As I told you, we are committed to continual improvement as one of the pillars of the organization, in addition to kind of that old fashioned hardworking police work. Because I'll tell you some of the other issues that we have, being being able to be proactive and doing traffic enforcement is the way we start finding some of the folks who are coming in who mean to do harm to people more than just in the uh, just in the in the driving so we are looking at some of those things as I said we are committed to that process we are committed to this community as I said the men and women who work for the Glendale Police Department work very very hard uh, and they are constantly looking for ways to improve the way that we do things and as I said we will keep that commitment thank you chief next item please Next item is a consent items, including minutes following our routine and may be acted upon by one motion. A member of council or the audience requesting separate consideration may do so by making such request before a motion is proposed. I'd like to pull 4C and D. If someone uh, I'll move the, like uh, to move the balance. I'll move the consent items. Second. Roll call, please. Council Member Zagajanian? Yes. Devine? 
Yes. Garpedian? Yes. Quintero? Yes. Mayor Najarian? Yes. And I don't need a report on 4C. 4C uh, is great news for the folks who live in the uh, La Crescenta, north, far north Glendale portion of Glendale. Uh, we are finally entering into a contract and construction agreement <coughs> to build sound walls along the 210 freeway between Lowell and Pennsylvania. So it's something that you've been asking for for quite a long time. It's a, a construction item that does not have usually the highest priority in Metro. Uh, much of this money is coming from Metro, but it's finally going to get done and uh, they should have a party in La Crescenta. So let us know, we'll be there and we'll certainly be there when we cut the ribbon for the sound wall. Yes, they cut ribbons for sound walls, believe it or not. Uh, it's just good news for all those who have uh, for so long advocated for the sound walls to be placed. I'll just move, can I move into 4D and then have the both voted on or? Sure, they both have to be written in the record at some point. Yeah. Oh, I didn't read that in, okay, uh, why don't we? Mr. Mayor, 4C is Director of Public Works regarding Glendale Interstate 2010 Freeway Sound Wall Construction Project. C1 is the motion authorizing the execution of cooperative agreement between the City of Glendale and the State of California, Caltrans. D is Director of Public Works regarding acceptance of Measure M subregional funds for transit capital to, to, to the B-Line Maintenance Facility Project. D1 is motion authorizing acceptance of Measure M subregional funds for transit capital in the amount of $4,426,000 for the B-Line Maintenance Facility Project and authorizing C manager to execute all agreements and documents necessary to accept and implement the funding. Two is a resolution appropriating $4,426,000. Uh, thank you. I'll address 4D now. Uh, 4D is our long awaited beeline maintenance facility. There's approximately $4.5 million of funding coming from Metro. And I wanted to highlight this not just because I'm on the Metro board, but in previous Council iterations, there was a lot of criticism toward Metro. The idea being that we're paying so much money into Metro and not getting anything back. But here is, uh, actually both of these items are uh, Metro funded projects back to the city of Glendale that's gonna make our quality of life better in terms of the sound and as well as providing much better uh, bus transit for our B-Line system and their repair and maintenance. And I would, that's all I need to say. Uh, some, Mr. Quintero? I'll move both items. Second. Roll call, please. C and D. Yes, moved by Councilmember Quintero, seconded by uh, Councilmember Agajanian. Councilmember Agajanian? Yes. Devine? Yes. Garpedian? Yes. Quintero? Yes. Mayor Najarian? Yes. Next item. Next item is City Council and staff comments. I will start from my left with Mr. Carpetian. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, well, last week was a very busy week as well, like every other week. Um, the, uh, the Las Muertos celebration was a great event at Artsakh Basil. Uh, the attendance was, I think, twice as much as last year. It was well attended, very fun event. Um, also, 10th annual Health Fest Glendale Health Festival was another great success uh, for our city. We had, I believe, over 800 uh, members of the community who came and received some sort of a, a medical treatment. Uh, joint meeting with the Glendale Community College was a, a successful meeting. I want to thank Mr. Mayor for, uh, I think it was the first time that we met as a joint joint meeting. Both uh, entities met. It was a great, 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 uh, great meeting. I think it's going to, we, we will have so many positive uh, things come from those meetings because then we understand each other as to two different entities, what, the, what are their goals uh, for the future. Um, I was at the Glendale Coordinating Council meeting, Homeowners Coordinating Council meeting. There were a couple of items that I wanted to ask our city manager to make a clarification. Um, one was the, the ice skating rink that we are going to have this year. Uh, there was a, a question and a complaint about why there are, we are we're doing this. Uh, we're throwing away five hundred thousand dollars, and there's a I think misinformation that was you know flo was floating around, and uh, they didn't have 
the, this concept of what, we, what was being done. And, and I told him, look, I said, this is something that this community wanted for so many years, and every year I was getting a call, why don't we have an ice rink when Burbank has one? And uh, the fact that there would be a charge and it would be some sort of, a, it would pay off maybe one third or half of the cost of the rink, as well as hopefully will be self-sufficient in the future, you know, upcoming years. So I want to get some answers on that. But before we go there, uh, also there is a, I was floating this idea around, I don't know how can we do it, if we can do it, uh, having a master calendar, community master calendar. I don't know how can we manage this, uh, because so many people are having events at the same time, not knowing that there are another three events at the same time, same same night, and uh, same date basically, and and it's getting really hard for people to attend those events. They're all good events, and you know our hospitals are non nonprofits. They all have different events that, especially Christmas times and holiday times, and you know some of the things that the questions that you're or uh, the issues that was brought up about ice skating ring, they all agreed that it's a fun thing, you know, for kids especially during Christmas time and holiday time. So why not have something that, you know, we're not we're in a fun city, I want we want to add to it and I wanna I wanna see if we can get some give us some information about sure. the ice uh, Onik Bulanikan, community services and parks director is here, he can answer the questions related to the ice rink. In terms of the master calendar we have a citywide master calendar in place, and there are certain organizations who still remember to utilize it. So they're good about uh, letting us know that they're going to have an event or a meeting, and we place it on that master calendar. And sometimes they even check with the city of Glendale to say, is something going on that you're, you're aware of on a particular night? Um, so maybe we can do a little bit of uh, a uh, media splash regarding the fact that we do have a master calendar and for those who feel comfortable to utilize it and let us know that they may be having certain uh, community types of events, we can place it on the calendar um, and that way there are no conflicting or as many conflicting <coughs> events um, that you all uh, see on a weekly basis because there are a number of conflicting events that do occur. I mean, if you if you approach them, you know, the hospitals, the nonprofits, Raptimus, and uh, you know, Rotary, Kiwanis, all of them. I mean, they they I think they will participate and put their uh, events on that on the calendar, master calendar, and it would make it easier for all, everybody to organize things. Onik, if you've got some responses on the ice ring, but make it quick. Sure. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor, and I join members of the council. Actually, um, the company will be in starting on Monday, uh, setting up the rink and uh, bringing in all the generators. Uh, admission fee is uh, about $17, $12 for the admission of $5 uh, for the skate rental. Uh, total cost through our uh, Measure S funds is $457,000. We're estimating between one hundred fifty dollars to $175,000 in revenue. Uh, the rink will open November 22nd, run through January 6th. And on November 22nd, we'll have a grand opening event. I believe that's around 3, 3.30. So there, it's uh, it will basically will cover one third of its cost. One third of the cost. The first year, and hopefully from the second year on, it will be a little bit more. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Quintero. Mr. Agajani. Ms. Devine. I have a few. Thank you, thank you. Um, I did attend the uh, <clears throat> Campbell Center had a uh, a bolathon on um, on Sunday. <clears throat> they uh, it, this is a uh, a foundation that uh, offers educational and vocational uh, training for developmentally developmentally disabled clients, uh, and I just want to thank uh, uh, the Jewel Jewel City Bowling Alley. Um, for offering their um, facility. Uh, Kiwanis uh, participated, Rotary participated, the Chamber participated. We had a lot of community um, 
uh, bowlers. They had it was a great time, and of course the winners are always the clients of of the Campbell Center. So kudos to all of those folks. Uh, uh, the De Los Muertos celebration. Uh, I wanted to uh, give kudos to Dr. Schaefer, who was here because it was the um, a director of libraries, arts, and culture, and our city clerk's office that uh, put it on. Uh, I want to give a, a shout out to all the staff because it really was a great event and there were a lot of people. It went from like four in the afternoon until almost 10 at night. It was just great. So thank you all for that. Um, <clears throat> finally, um, last night I went to a uh, a very extraordinary uh, event at the uh, YWCA, uh, where are the Glendale, well, I'm sorry, the YMCA, the Glendale YMCA signed an MOU to be like a sister Y uh, to a YMCA in Artsakh. And it was a great way to bring uh, communities together countries together uh, for help and for guidance. And so um, I just want to uh, congratulate uh, uh, the YMCA board president, Steve Bullock, um, and Nora Yakubian, who was very um, uh, instrumental in bringing about this uh, collaboration. Um, Artie was uh, Kosaki and I guess was involved, Senator Portantino. A lot of people worked very hard uh, to, to bring about this um, uh, collaboration. And uh, it was uh, a, a quite impressive. And uh, I congratulate everybody that had anything to do with that because now we have a YW, a YM, I keep saying YW, YMCA in Artsakh and one here in Glendale that will be working together, sharing ideas, and helping each other out. So um, congratulations. So Glendale's on the map once again. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Agajanian. Leading a little bit earlier, we were talking about citation. I asked the police chief in 2014, uh, the police department issued 19,400 tickets, 2015, 16,000 tickets, 2016, 15,000 tickets, and now in 2019, in, three, in nine months. Uh, 15,000. So it means by the end of the year, we're going to have 20,000 tickets issued to the drivers. I just uh, personally myself, I don't want to see just writing the tickets. If more tickets is more safer, is better. It has to be an element of education. I agree there are young kids driving very fast on Glen Oaks, where my office is, my studio is, by Glen, Glen Oaks Boulevard. Uh, that's right. The police should stop them and give them a ticket. But uh, give them a ticket is OK. But however, there should be some sort of education, too. We just, this police power that writing tickets, and if we write more tickets, we'll be better and safe. Is not going to work. So we have to have education element with this. Maybe we have to have classes in the schools to go and talk to those who will starting to drive at 16. I don't know why they have to drive at 16 years old. I didn't let my two kids to drive before 18 years old. I think that's safer. But however, the point I'm trying to make, just by writing tickets, nothing will change. So we have to have element of education with tickets. Otherwise, this will continue forever. Thank you. Mr. Mayor. Thank you. If, you get, if you get a ticket, you go to a driver's education school. So it doesn't go on your record. So there is education uh, the component to the tickets. Uh, and we also have education uh, programs around the city, but I agree with you wholeheartedly. But Council Member I'm Adichai. sorry. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. They just get ticket and they go to traffic school is not enough. Traffic school now became a joke. They sit down by computer and they answer the question. There was time, I was in this uh, state, in this city, that there was traffic schools which police officers were teaching in those traffic school tickets. When you would get a ticket, you would go to school, 
a police officer will educate you, will ask you what happened, and try to educate you. Traffic school now is the kids, they do by computer, they look at the paperwork and just do it. I don't think that traffic school helps anybody. But however, education is a different issue in the schools, and uh, police may go and visit them in a school and try to teach them how to drive in the city. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, it's a, obviously, it's an interesting discussion that I think will wait for that report to come back and we can talk about different ways to uh, to deal with that uh, one thing that wasn't mentioned uh, briefly that the chief uh, during the chief's comments is that the fines for those tickets do not go to the city of glendale just a very small fraction i think it's like five percent uh, or less than 10 percent go to the city of glendale the rest goes to the county to the state and to uh, different jurisdictions. I want to let everyone know Glendale is hopping. When I say it's hopping, we have so many events that go on, not just on the weekends. I'm talking about Mondays, Tuesdays, and I don't just mean in the evenings. I mean at breakfast time, noon time, mid-afternoon, evening. It is really more events than I have seen in the 14 or 15 years that I've been up here. I think Mr. Quintero would probably agree. Things are just, <laughs> pick a year, pick a year where it's better, where it's, it's been more. So if we can't come to your event, please, again, I said this before, don't take it personally. If you see one of us at your event, that council member uh, or mayor is representing the entire city council. And we try our very best to get to these events uh, to give you the due recognition that you have, that you need. I had an interesting meeting yesterday with the uh, Council General of Kuwait, and I was confused on my way to Beverly Hills. Why does the Council General of Kuwait want to meet with me or anyone from Glendale? Uh, as it turns out, the uh, tech efforts that we have in Glendale, our Tech Week and our Tech Incubator and Tech Accelerator discussions, came to uh, his attention and he wanted to know if there's any way we could assist uh, Kuwait. Now, Kuwait is, of course, one of the most wealthiest uh, state, nation states uh, out there. They've got all the uh, energy and oil money that they want. That doesn't mean they just like to throw it around down rabbit holes and do the wrong thing. So they wanted to know what it was that Glendale was doing that was attracting, attracting tech companies to the city of Glendale and uh, in what manner, if any, that could be uh, extrapolated to Kuwait. So we uh, discussed briefly ways to cooperate, and their office will be contacting our economic development uh, office, and we'll be talking to them, hopefully, about what we're looking for in a tech accelerator, why it is that tech companies are coming to Glendale, why should they come to Glendale, and uh, those sort of points. So it was very interesting, very interesting discussion. The point being that our efforts in Glendale at Tech Week, that some of us, let's be honest, some of us aren't sure how much value it really has, but uh, it has come to the attention of uh, foreign countries on the other side of the world uh, who are also uh, pursuing tech and are of like mind with Glendale. So that was very interesting. And that is all I have to say. Are there any comments by staff? All right, let's move to the next item. Mr. Mayor, the next portion of this uh, agenda is the community event announcements, which are limited to three minutes, along with the public comments for individuals who wish to issue the five minute portion to be able to speak for three minutes at this point. Okay, I have a request from Robin Lee Hansen and Karen Cook Ryan of the Glendale Quilt Guild. You each have three minutes, but I suppose you could have six minutes together. You could have six minutes together. 
Uh, good evening. Um, I would like to thank the mayor and the uh, council members for allowing us to come and visit. My name is Karen Cook Ryan, and I'm here with Robin Hansen. Uh, we're representing the Glendale Quilt Guild, and I've been a member since 1982, and Robin's been a member for four Maybe months. Four months. <laughs> um, the word Glendale, to me, is equal to quilting. I don't live in Glendale. I have never lived in Glendale. So when I'm here tonight and hearing about Glendale, police, your community, I've been here so many times throughout the years, and it's an honor to be here and to hear that there's so much more to Glendale than quilting, even though it's hard to believe. So we're here tonight to share the news about our Glendale Quilt Show, which is going to be held March 28th and 29th, 2020 at the Glendale Civic Auditorium. That was our first show in 1982. And we continue to have shows there and at the Burbank Marriott. Our show became huge with approximately eight to 10,000 attendees at the uh, Burbank Marriott. I was the quilt show president. I was the quilt show chair. I've been every job except the treasurer. Um, I love quilting and I love it every day and there's something different that happens all the time. Um, so now we have 501C3 status and um, our quilt show has been compromised by private shows. Private um, companies were looking and seeing, Glendale was the first one, we really were. We were bigger than Ontario is and so now we are returning and having our show at Glendale, we're very excited to be there. And I brought some quilts for you to see, just to show you kind of, it's not a blanket, it's not crochet, it's not knitting. This is an art form. And um, a quilting just, just you'll be surprised if you, when you come to our show to see what quilting looks like. Um, Robin is going to be in charge of our boutique. And uh, at the boutique, we'll, we'll have handmade items we uh, have vendors that are selling fabric, jewelry, vintage items, and other interesting vendors. The funds raised uh, will be used to hire speakers for our meetings, pay rent on our space at the um, Wins Athletic Club, and to purchase supplies for charity quilts that our members make for hospitals, veterans, hospice, and other similar sources. I'm happy to hear Glendale is interested in the arts as per the appointment to the Arts Commission. Our Glendale Quilt Guild is a harmonious blend of charity work, art, education, and volunteerism. And I thank you for listening to our announcement, Robin. Because I belong to several 5013Cs, we're going to be working with the Glendale Historical Society and putting on a mini quilt show there. So sometime next year, we aren't exactly sure what slot we're going to do. We will be having all of our really skilled quilters showing and teaching how, uh, showing, demonstrating, and teaching how we do quilts. Uh, to begin with, quilts were a recycling project. So, you know, all things weren't, you couldn't, in the old days, run out to the quilt store and buy new fabric. You would use what you had, and you would use scraps to make it, you know, the Victorians were huge recyclers. They're the original recyclers. They used everything until the end of it. but. Look for us on our uh, on the Historical Society page, and I'm sure that we'll get on the master calendar, and uh, we'll really look forward to teaching you more. But please come to our quilt show. It's not just for quilters. It's an art. is a very vibrant thing. I'll be running the boutique, as Karen said, and we'll have lots of items. I kind of wish it were before Christmas 
but there are things that, uh, that are very useful. They're not just quilts. We do a ton of things. You just can't imagine what we do, and we're busy at it. We work hours and hours um, at the Women's Athletic uh, Club, and we're all, a lot of us are members there as well. So thank you so much for letting us speak, and have a wonderful evening. Website. Oh, the website. What, what is it? Our website is www.glendalequiltguild.org. Thank you so much. Thank you. Tony Passarella. Good evening, Mayor, Council Members, staff, and most importantly, viewing public, Tony Passarella. Well, this is a very serious topic that I'm talking about. Um, week three in uh, my campaign to uh, create awareness uh, about the 5G deployment um, slash small cell site. So I got a very, if you won't believe me, then maybe you'll believe the experts. Artie, can you roll that video? Then I'll come back up. It's just two minutes. I'm Sharon Goldberg. I'm an internal medicine physician. I've practiced medicine for 21 years, and my background is mostly academic, internal medicine, hospital-based, clinical research, and medical education. I'm a certified Microsoft small business specialist. I've worked on space station designing the cabling system for the airlock module, where I was responsible for EMI, EMC analysis, which is electromagnetic interference, electromagnetic compatibility. I am a professor in the Department of Epidemiology biostatistics and occupational health and I teach there both toxicology and health effects of electromagnetic radiation. My name is Daphne Tachover and I'm the founder of an organization called We Are The Evidence. Uh, we are an organization that represents the many adults and unfortunately many children who have become very sick from wireless technology radiation. There seems to be a couple false Easter eggs being put out there right now. I want to make sure we dispel that right off the gate. The effects of wireless on health scientifically are very, very clear. So it's always pushed back to the definition of an acceptable level of radiation. And that's what this is, by the way. This is about radiation. Wireless radiation has biological effects, period. My name is Dr. Angie Kolbeck. I've been reviewing the studies showing the impacts of wireless radiation on our health, and there are now thousands of studies showing the following adverse health impacts to wireless radiation. Cancer, oxidative damage, DNA damage, DNA failure. Things like you know, memory, uh, dizziness, anxiety, brain fog. Headaches, nosebleeds, cognitive problem, exhaustion. We have evidence of DNA damage, cardiomyopathy, which is the precursor of congestive heart failure. By the way, they're presenting on, on the Hill in Washington, D.C. Um, I'm not here to scare people. I'm not a fear monger. I'm, I'm a true seeker. And I'm just trying to uh, alert the people of Glendale, uh, the council members, staff, and anybody within uh, the sound of my voice. Please do your research. This is going to affect all of us at some point in time. They want to roll out more and more of these as the time passes. They're going to be on every city block. Uh, in every neighborhood, near schools, and so it's a very, very serious issue. Please, uh, Glendalians, do your research. You can start here, ehtrust.org, ehtrust.org. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Jean Kagan. Good evening, Mr. Mayor. Honored Councilmen, City Officials. My name is Jean Kagan. I'm the Program Vice President for Seroptimus International of Glendale. With me is our President, Martha Wilson, and our President-elect, Diane Lambelot. And we are here tonight because getting a college education shouldn't mean going hungry or being food insecure. But that's what it does mean for half of the 2.1 million students in our community colleges. In fact, 40% of these students reported skipping meals last year because they couldn't afford to buy food. Now, 
when students are worried about where their next meal is coming from, or even if it's coming, their ability to learn and attend class suffers. And when talented students are forced to delay their studies or drop out because of this food insecurity, this hunger, it's a loss to our entire community. And quite frankly, if you're not a student on campus, or you don't know students on campus, you're probably not aware that there's food insecurity and hunger on our community college campuses. But there is. Hunger is the hidden crisis on our college campuses. We at Seroptimus International of Glendale have become aware of this, and what we want to do is stimulate community awareness because with awareness comes action. So we have put together a forum which will take place on Thursday, November 14th from 7 to 8.15 p.m. in the downtown Central Library. We have a distinguished faculty who will address this issue. Senator Anthony Portantino has joined our faculty. Uh, we also have Ellen Oppenberg, who is the Outreach Coordinator for the Food for Thought Pantry at Glendale Community College. Mr. Albert Hernandez, Executive Director of Family Promises of the Verdugos. And a student panel of three to four students who have experienced food insecurity, hunger, right here on our campus here in Glendale. We sincerely hope that you and the rest of the community will attend our forum, will hear more about the facts of this very real crisis on our campus, and find out what you can do to make an impact to try and <coughs> help these students. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Quick question. Yes, Mr. Uh, I have a quick question. Do you? Based on your research, do you know what those numbers are in Glendale, Glendale Community College? Um, the closest I can come right now is a number that Dr. Viar gave out. We were at a special forum held by um, Adam Schiff with uh, members of four different community colleges, and he said that annually they give out 70 to 100,000 units of food in the food pantry. Now remember, those items in the food pantry come as donations into the food pantry, and these students who cannot afford to buy food have a point system where they can pull food from the pantry to meet their basic needs. But that sounds pretty significant to me. 70,000 units in 70 one year? 70 to 100,000 units per year. That is year. what Dr. That's Bayar a, said. Of and I remember writing it down because I was really rather astounded by the number. Sure. I think we can add that a lot of our efforts this year um, at Sir Optimist is donating to the food pantry, both in terms of items and financially. We just had a recent event where our members have collected over $2,000 in cash that we'll be donating to the food pantry, and we filled three 50-gallon um, containers of food. So this is our first effort. Next week will be our second effort, and we really do hope that you can help us bring the awareness of this to our local communities. Seventy-five percent of the people that have stand in line at the food pantry are women. women. Ms. Devine? Yeah, I just wanted to uh, <clears throat> thank you, Sir Optimus, for, for bringing this to our attention. I did attend the, uh, the event uh, where we donated. I am a seroptimist, and we donated uh, the food to the food pantry, and I think uh, uh, a lot of, um, of uh, uh, compliments have to go to Glendale College, and I guess it's Dr. Oppenberg yes. for, for putting this uh, program together for the students at the college, and for everybody out there to know that you, if you ever want to donate food, you know, you can always probably just take a bag of food up to the college and donate Absolutely. any day, any time. At the forum, we will provide instructions on what you can do. And again, it's, you don't have to do something big. A lot of people think, oh, I have to you know, go in with a busload. I mean, believe it or not, a simple flat of ramen noodles is about $4. And that can mean the difference whether somebody is really hungry tonight or has something in their stomach. Sure. 
So we sincerely hope that the community will come and join us uh, at the library, second floor auditorium, and um, all are welcome, and uh, thank you. It's a noble thank thing you. you're doing. Great, you. great job. Thank you. I don't have any other cards. I'll close this portion of oral communications and ask for the next item. Under action items, 8A is Director of Public Works regarding downtown Glendale and Montrose comprehensive parking analysis. 8A1 <coughs> is a motion approving the recommended parking management strategies outlined in the comprehensive parking analysis. Two is a resolution adopting change in hours of operation for on and off street parking meters in downtown Glendale, Montrose and increasing and adding certain fees in the citywide fee schedule. And three is an ordinance for introduction related to parking, parking meter zones. Thank you, Ms. Beers. Yes, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, the much-awaited Montrose and downtown parking analysis that we have been uh, waiting for for some time. Uh, I'm going to go directly to Mr. Emrani, who will kick us off before, I think, going to our consultant uh, who did the actual analysis. But with that, we'll go to Mr. Emrani first. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of City Council. Uh, we are pretty excited to be presenting the uh, results of the uh, Montrose and downtown uh, parking study. Uh, we have a very short presentation that's going to be done by our uh, consultant who did this study and uh, we'll be happy to answer any questions. So I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Dan McKinney of Transport Group. Hi, good evening, Mayor and Council Members and City Staff. Um, my name is Dan McKinney. I'm with the Transpo Group. I've been a, a owner and a principal there uh, for over 20 years, and I've got a lot of national and international experience dealing with transportation and parking issues. Uh, we were brought on board by the city, um, the city to address uh, parking conditions throughout the city in both uh, downtown and Montrose. So we have two separate reports for that. Um, and I've got a slideshow here that we'll walk through real quickly as we can. Uh, what I want to impress upon you is that parking is a valuable asset. Just like any other asset that the city has and manages within the city, the parking can be utilized to kind of support citywide goals and objectives. Everything from economic development to reducing congestion and providing neighborhood livability. It also provides a first and last impression within the city um, for many patrons that are coming in. So if you're a visitor coming in the city and you park your car, and then you're leaving, it's all, it, it adds to that first and last impression. This really making that a positive experience is important. It kind of ties into the city's uh, goal of providing a pro positive, exceptional customer service experience. And then um, in terms of our scope of work, we collaborate with the city and city staff to kind of do a comprehensive evaluation of both downtown and Montrose, as we said. So we did two separate studies evaluating over 4,000 parking spaces, collected hourly data both on weekdays and weekends, and, and from that we did an evaluation of different occupancies, durations of stay, and other statistics that we looked at to look at trends, patterns, and so forth. And as we analyzed that, we ended up looking at um, what can we do for parking management strategies to move forward and do that. As part of the process, we also did some public outreach. And with regards to the public outreach, the, we had some public meetings, the first of which was a presentation we did to the Transportation and Parking Commission. Um, and secondly, we had separate meetings in downtown and in Montrose talking about each one of those separate reports. As part of that, we, we had some stakeholder collaboration as well. So in the downtown area, we interacted and had uh, good conversations with the Greater Downtown Glendale Association for the downtown. And in Montrose, the Montrose Shopping Park Association and Glendale Community College. What was kind of interesting and, and great to see out of the Montrose one is that the Montrose uh, Parking Task Force was created. That was really a collaboration between the city and Montrose Shopping Park Association to kind of talk about things on a weekly basis to um, really dive into and, and address concerns that each, each, each party had. From that, I'll quickly get into some of the key findings that we had in each of the reports. Um, the downtown key findings, um, which encompassed, encompassed a, a study area of almost you know, 3,400 uh, parking spaces. That really is bounded by the 134 freeway to the north, Colorado to the south, and Central and Luis to the east and the west. And from that, we 
really we're identifying that there is enough parking within the city as a whole to address the needs. However, there was significant congestion and hot spots in certain areas. That really included uh, Brand Boulevard having the most congestion and the highest demand for parking throughout all of the day. Um, and as well as some of the surface lots where we were finding longer term employee parking was provided. What was interesting is that we did find that the public garages did have lower occupancies and a lot of available parking in those areas. And in downtown, we noticed the peaking conditions occurred during the day, um, during the weekday, which kind of represented the, the supporting the local land uses and business communities and lunchtime activities that would occur in downtown. But on the weekends, it was peaking in the evening, re reflecting nighttime and, and uh, evening activities that were happening there. Um, we also looked at the, the pricing of the garages, um, public garages as compared to the market conditions. We did notice that the public garages are providing a val better value or lower cost than, than your privately available garages. That isn't necessarily a bad thing, but it just means that you are providing a better value for that. Um, looking at Montrose, some of the key findings there, there's around 800 spaces that we looked at in the Montrose community. And that was a, a study area is bounded by a, Florencita and Broadview and Los Palmas and Verdugo. Um, and in that area, the, the highest occupancy was really found along Honolulu Avenue. Again, similar to Brand, where that is your most desired parking and right in front on street where all the activity is occurring. Um, we also found that the high long-term occupancy was found in some of the off-street parking lots where the, there is a less time limits and duration, duration of stay were longer. Um, peaking conditions were different in Montrose than they were in downtown as you might ex expect given the land uses. Since the land uses are more retail oriented and um, restaurant oriented in nature, we're seeing weekday peaks occurring in the evenings and then during the weekends it was occurring during the days, reflecting more of a visitor type of situation than a business situation. Um, one other thing I want to point out too is that peak conditions didn't necessarily align with when payment hours were being collected. So payments are like from um, payments, payment collection ends around 6 p.m. in Montrose, but peaking conditions were happening at 7 and 8 p.m. So I'll get into the parking strategies really quick to dive into that. Really overall, I think we want to move toward a performance-based parking approach. And this is really getting at a data-driven uh, approach where we're utilizing data to make some decisions, taking some of the emotion out of it, and making sure that when we make decisions, we're reflecting a a commonality and, and something that's very uh, identifiable by staff and also um, and, and by the public. They can understand what we're going to be doing by, with these different aspects. Currently there's kind of a target occupancy of 85 percent in the city. That's a pretty sta industry standard uh, number that you might hear with relation to parking. 85 percent typically represents the, at the point at which parking be, tends to feel uh, more congested and it becomes harder to find spaces. And what we want to do is identify a target range or a sweet spot window of 70 to 85%. So if we are in that 70 to 85% window, you typically have one to two spaces available per block face um, and parking is available where you can find it. If it's above that, it's, it ends up being too congested and feels crowded. If it's below that, you end up having a, a maybe it, it doesn't feel like there's any activity. It feels a little bit dead because there's no cars around. So if those prices are above, or if those uh, percentages are above or below those rates, we tend to make adjustments and management strategies reflecting that. So if, if we're having occupancies above 85%, we'll increase the prices or increase the management strategies around that. If they're below that, we could even decrease the prices and, and entice more people to park there. And really, it's just to balance the parking field better. With regards to pricing strategies, I think we're looking for a tiered pricing approach and having the highest demand parking be charged the most and the lowest demand being charged the least. And so typically that what would we find that to be is the highest demand on street parking. For example, in our areas um, in Montrose would be Honolulu and downtown would be Brand. And then reflecting the lower prices as you go down this, the, the structure. When we look at this, we want to think about annual adjustments and phases. And so first we would think about raising the prices now. We're recommending raising the prices in those busiest areas. So we can help shift and move those demands to other areas. We'd recommend increasing those rates at a 50 cent increments and expanding areas as, as um, needed as demand shifts when these prices or adjustments are made. 
Um, in downtown specific, I think we're recommending to keep the 90 minutes of free in downtown garages and also expanding the theater validation program in downtown. The reason is, is that we have ample um, parking in those garages right now, so let's continue to utilize those programs. With regards to parking regulations, I think we want to shift the paid uh, parking times to better meet the demands. I kind of mentioned that in Montrose, the, the demands are peaking after and later in the evening. So I think really what we're talking about doing is shifting demands um, more toward the evenings. So less in the morning and more toward the evenings. And so it's, it's not necessarily reducing the amount or increasing the amount of time. We're just shifting it to more meet the demands of when those are occurring. We're, on, we're wanting to move to rely more on a tiered pricing strategy versus a time limit restriction. Um, and we want to update employee parking programs in Montrose, because I think we mentioned uh, one of the things that is happening in Montrose is there's some longer term parking thing that is occurring in some of the parking lots that we want to evaluate that a little bit closer and see if we can update that current employee parking program that is outdated. I think it's, it's around, last time it was updated it was around 20 years ago, I believe. Um, and then obviously as we make these changes, we want to monitor the results and iteratively make adjustments as we move forward. Some of the other things that we're, the city's been working on is the parking program improvements. And you've probably already noticed this and seen this, is that the pay stations um, have been coming into place in downtown. And I think those are expanding and replacing some of the single space meters. Um, the city just this summer introduced LPR enforcement or license plate recognition vehicles that are now patrolling the um, uh, parking enforcement. And also you have the, the digital guidance systems for parking wayfinding to guide you to available parking spaces in some of those larger garages that have ample parking. We're going to continue to expand on that, which is great. And these are best practices that we're really, it's good to see that Glendale's doing this. It's kind of ahead of the curve than a lot of the cities. And then moving, to, moving ahead, I think we're moving into that pay by plate system so that you would end up paying through the pay station using your license plate. That would help the enforcement vehicles to be able to recognize when payment is made more efficiently. And it also allows us to introduce the mobile app or mobile payment system when we have a pay by plate. And then obviously expanding on the branding and wayfinding that you've already done and seeing if we can enhance that, improve that, and guiding people to available parking. And then one of the things that through the pricing program and stuff, as new revenues come into it, this new revenues can help fund some of these different aspects to the parking. So with that, we've got a, a quick summary slide that kind of outlines some of this just so that you, we don't have to flip back and forth through all the slides. But if you have any questions, we can kind of, uh, myself and city staff can help answer some of the questions about the study and recommendations. OK, let's raise that. A lot of work was done. I know there's been a lot of community involvement. Uh, thanks to the uh, representatives from Montrose, I know you had a very vigorous task force, uh, series of meetings. You met with me a couple times, and I think uh, probably every council member uh, shared their thoughts with you. Uh, Who would like to make comments at this point? Do we have any speakers, or? I just have one speaker. Would you like to hear from the speakers? Let's go to Drew Sugars. Good evening, Mayor, Honorable Mayor and Council. I am Drew Shiggers, Director of Communications and Community Relations for Glendale Community College, where we aspire to be the region's premier learning community. Uh, real quick background for the public. I'm here representing the college in regards to the parking uh, analysis. In addition to our largest campus on North Verdugo Road and our Garfield campus north of Adams Square, we have our Montrose campus on Honolulu Avenue. That's where our professional development center, the PDC has been providing job skills and business uh, training for more than three decades. And about two years ago, we purchased the former Citibank building right next door to the PDC. Now this new property will allow GCC to offer credit and non-credit classes to residents in Glendale's northern area, but we, we're gonna need to do some extensive remodeling of that particular property. And as you all know, when you're planning for the future, there is oftentimes fear of the unknown. So I'm here to commend city staff for their proactive approach to addressing any fears that may have arisen with our upcoming projects, specifically to the parking needs in that area. Uh, your public works director and parking manager, Tad Dombrowski and, and, and director Imrani, uh, both work to bring the public, business owners, and other stakeholders together to address these concerns. 
At GCC, we believe education is at the core of critical thinking. By educating the public, your city staff was able to alleviate many fears and allow people to see more clearly what the future holds. And we think the future is very bright in Montrose. We're excited to bring more educational opportunities, and we will be very sensitive to the parking needs there as we bring in more students to that area. And we look forward to working together with city staff in the future to make sure that the public, uh, we can alleviate their fears of any unknowns. Thank you. Thank you. I do have another card from Andre Ordebegian and Steve Pierce. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Majarian, council members, and city staff. My name is Andro Debegian. I'm the president of Montreal Shopping Park Association. Along with me is our uh, communication administrator, Steve Pierce. Uh, one of the things that we were going to talk about here today is one of the concerns, as a matter of fact, that we had was to improve the growth of our business improvement district in Montrose. And the biggest concern we had was parking. So um, I had a couple of meetings with uh, Mayor Najarian, and we addressed the concerns and everything else, and he had great ideas, uh, some of the things that we can implement in, in our uh, BID. And um, after that, our task force was created, uh, alongside Yazdan and Tad and Jeff, and that was a great help on the, analyzing the whole situations that we have over there. Ultimately, we wanted a great uh, parking structure that could be beneficial to our town and the surrounding uh, uh, neighbors and the community members and all that stuff. And, uh, but the collaboration that we had alongside GCC, they've been a great help. So we were all on the table. We were talking about all the problems that uh, will arise or we have uh, right now and how do we address it. And uh, I just want to commend the task force. They've been extremely helpful. It shows the uh, great work that uh, the community can do together when they come together. And uh, we accomplished a lot of uh, positive points. And we're going through these protocols to implement every single one of those that will benefit our neighborhood, our BID, and hopefully our residents and the community. Uh, I just want to thank everybody and uh, ask Steve if he has a couple of more things that he wants to add. Uh, Mr. Mayor and Council, uh, my name is Steve Pierce, and I just want to emphasize again what Andre was just mentioning, that the task force was incredibly uh, worthwhile. Uh, we reached out to all the merchants in our, our town, and uh, that was helpful. But uh, just having that communication with the task force, and Yaz, I want to thank you very much, and Tad and, and Dan and, and Jeff, too. Uh, it just was really one of those things that just all came together and really worked. And we're going to continue that. Uh, we're not just going to stop and, and at the end of this, uh, this meeting tonight. Uh, we're going to continue on and working with the uh, task force and the city of Glendale. So thank you very much. It, uh, it's one of those things that all came together. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Hopefully we can uh, see the results soon. Everything's being implemented. They have the task force. We'll give you all the reports. And uh, hopefully if everything works out, we're going to continue it. If not, then we'll talk about the structures <laughs> later. I know you will. I know you will. Thank you so much. <laughs> Any questions? I've got to ask. Right. I yes. just want to make sure because <laughs> <laughs> I have to ask. So you read this report. Yes. You know what's in it. Mm -hmm. You work with the staff and the team and everybody else, and you're you're okay with this. Uh, Thank you for you, asking. You, you know, the thing. One of the things they they asked us the same thing too is that we had a lot of concerns, and uh, when the task work force was uh, formed. Uh, we addressed every one of the problems that we have. We reached out to our community members, to our merchants, and we asked them, I said, these are the things that we're trying to implement because there's so many hidden areas that we, had, we were clueless. We don't know exactly how things were happening. So by um, going forward with this task force, and I, I think three of them already been implemented. One of them was enforcements, that they brought the new cars that you know, take the license plates and shows how many uh, hours or minutes or whatever no, it is. My, my, my question is is that yes, we are the, okay with your, it. Your, your concerns were addressed and task force and between all of you. Absolutely, and, yes. So you're, you're fine with it. That's, we are that's, fine with it. That. Thank you so much. And you're, on, you're being recorded. <laughs> yes, I, I'm aware of that. Thank you. No, no, we are aware of that. No, no, no. It's just, I, and I want to thank each and every one of you. Uh, I've been reached out several times, uh, Ms. Devine. Mayor Najarian, yourself, uh, Councilmember Carpetian, your concerns and your involvement 
in our city, it means a lot to us. Anytime we have a concern, you, you come over there and ask us and you listen, and that's what makes the difference. That's what makes a great community. Great thank you so you. very much. Thank, thank you. you, thank you. And, and let's be clear that you're fine with it, and I'm fine with it, but I'm only fine with it uh, as it works. If it doesn't work, and we agreed that these are incremental steps, Absolutely. modest incremental steps towards managing the parking. Um, you know, uh, one solution that you were very uh, uh, advocated for was the parking garage. Well, before we get to that expensive parking garage that's going to create issues, this. we're going to try all these different parking management uh, systems and the uh, pricing strategies and the enforcement uh, as uh, presented by our uh, consultant. So we hope it works. We're going to try it, uh, assuming that we have the votes. Uh, I haven't counted votes or anything, but... If it doesn't work, we're back. The square one. We're back. Just... Not the square one. We know what hasn't worked. We're at square two. Uh, and where do we go from there to make it work? So the important thing is that you have a city council and staff uh, that's willing to sit down and listen to the issues and try and make it a success. And it goes not just with the Montrose uh, shopping park area, but also with our downtown region as well. You guys are just more strong advocates. Thank you. Uh, I just want to take reading. you up on one of the great uh, ideas that you have was the, uh, the valet, uh, valet yeah. parking that you offered. Hopefully we can implement it in Montrose. That See will bring that a works. tremendous amount of attraction to Montrose. And one of the goals, as I mentioned before, is try to improve the, you know, the city, uh, the, our town uh, future. So I think that might be something that if you can look into. And one last thing that I just want to have a special thanks to our first responders, our police officers. As you may know, I'm also the part of the Glendale uh, Police Advisory uh, Board. I see how hard these people work. It's an amazing, uh, and I want to agree with uh, Council Member Agajanian about education. It's a must. And I didn't know a lot of stuff when I started attending their meetings. I found out a lot of good things that these people are doing. They're jeopardizing their lives every day. So I want a special thanks to every single one of them in fires, our fire departments, our uh, police officers, our officers, and our volunteers. Thank you very much, and thank you all for you, being here for us. Thanks thank again. Thank you, Steve and Andre. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. City Attorney, so let's just frame this issue. We've got a couple moving pieces here. So we have the um, we have the recommendations from parking management strategies, which we've just been presented with. This is the general, right, uh, strategy. general strategy. But then we get a little bit more specific. Uh, the second item is adopting the uh, hours of operations uh, for on and off street parking meters in Glendale and Montrose, and increasing certain fees in the Fee wide, uh, city and, and wide just fee for scale. the record, there was a minor modification to that, Mr. Mayor. It's uh, and it wasn't really a modification; it was a blank in in one of the tables in the resolution. So that's been that's been submitted to you as part of the as part of the item. Okay. Uh, and the third is the ordinance for introduction related to the parking meter zones. Uh, do we have a clear indication of that? Those parking meter zones. It's I see it listed. Um, it's listed in red by line. language. By but language, maybe you want to have staff go through the zones that are being added uh, to the to the um, the parking meter zones that are being added to the code. I'd like to know. Good evening, Mayor Jarian, Council members, uh, Tad Dombrowski, City Parking Manager. <clears throat> the in the ordinance, there were several things that were accomplished. Uh, the there were a few uh, zones that were added including Wickham Way up in Montrose and Louise and Maryland down in the downtown and then the, we also removed some of the time restrictions if we want to try managing by the pricing versus the time restrictions we need to not have it in the code where we have to come and ask council each time to try something out so we just removed the time restrictions in the code that forced us for a parking lot to have two hour, three hour, four hour restrictions. And now we'll leave out there what's there today, but we have the ability to make some changes and see what works and what doesn't. And it's also adding the Montrose lots to the correct to the um, ordinance. Okay. Um, when this comes back, 
Will we have a, a more detailed map or something? I think a visual, for me, speaking for myself, Sure. Or is well, that just too complicated a thing with all the, the little? I, I think we I think we could provide it's a map. Probably workable. We'll we'll definitely try it. Um, I, but I think we can. As I sit here and look at the zones, um, in terms of the changes that are in place, um, I believe we 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 would be able to do it. And the technology? Are we leaving that open? Um, so one was the license plate. <coughs> Pasadena has that, I think, um, where you have to not just log in and buy your time, but you have, your car has to be registered and your license plate has to be uh, approved, not approved, but recorded uh, and validated, if you will. So are we leaving the technology open for now for all these different zones that we're creating? Uh, Mayor Najarian, in the downtown area, we already have Brand Boulevard and the parking lots with the new meters that would accept it. So it really is just a software program and a change that could be done relatively simply to change to a pay by plate environment. With the single space meters, we don't have the capability at this time. So we just leave those until we get money because they're correct. not cheap. Correct. I mean, they're that's a significant. Okay. Questions, Mr. Mayor? Mr. Carpet. Yes. Uh, I think instead of just giving us the legal description of this. There's lots. Most of them have, like the one in Montrose, they have Montrose Lot 2, Lot 3, but most of them have their legal descriptions. Uh, some of those, maybe the addresses of these properties, it would be along with the map, so it would, we can read it easier. Uh, so with the, with the meters that you put money in, single, single pay meters, uh, what's the restriction on how many hours you can park? Is it like two hours again, or it's like you change that? Did you take that out too, or it's only on, on our parking lots. When I say parking lots, I mean the open air parking lots, right? Not the parking structures. Correct. Uh, Councilman Grappetian, what we did was we took it out of the code, but the, but the signs that are out there will generally stay in place. We'll still leave the time restrictions in place. It would only be if we were trying something to say as we're, as we're changing and shifting over into the pay, if we get merchant complaints and they, they, a new business moves in, we want to be able to change a regulation that might have been 30 minutes before and now make it an hour or two hours or whatever is ideal for that, that business that moves in. Okay. So we have a little more flexibility. So on this, on this timing, we're going from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. Uh, 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. from 6 to 10 p.m. Uh, 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. to 8 a.m. to 12 a.m. I think that's, that's a little excessive, uh, the 12 a.m. part of it. I think 10 p.m. is, to me, I mean, I, I think from 8 to 12, I know we want to have 18-hour city and everything, especially in downtown area, 12, 12 a.m. is a little bit excessive. Um, also, the downtown area in Glendale, when, when you park in one block, you can park only for two hours. Am I correct? Then you have to move your car. Is that the same way for the evenings as well? Because when you go to a, I don't know, a show at Alex Theater, you find a spot in the front, you park there. I know we're trying to encourage people to park in our parking structures. But if you find a spot, you park there, and you can't come back and increase your, because it's two hours only for one block. So you have to move your car. That's kind of inconvenient, and it just takes away from that you know, convenience that we, we're trying to provide for our, 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 our residents or our constituents. So how, how would that work? Um, I got this after 6 p.m. Is there is there a way to program it or, or not? For the single space meters, there's not. Those no. are those are programmed for a flat time period for throughout the day. However, on an individual basis, if there were meters and and let's say the Alex Theater was a good example, if there were meters around there where long term parking would be okay because it was underutilized, and we want to carve out a section of them and change them from two hour meters to pay for as long as you want. We could do that now administratively, see how it works, and then be able to come back and change it if needed. So when you say single space meters, you're the ones in, on, on Brown Boulevard from, I don't know, Colorado all the way up to Lexington, you're talking about those? On Brand are the multi-space meters, and those, there is the ability to program those. That's what I'm talking about, because those are the ones that you can only park two hours per day, per block. So those are programmable. I think Correct. we need to look into it maybe at the 
evening hours, you extend that to maybe four hours. So go have a dinner. You don't want to find a spot to park in the front. I don't know how difficult or, or how how easy this is to, to program it that every day it changes. Uh, but the, the balance, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, the, the balancing act, as, as you stated yourself, Council Member Garpetian, related to the need to want to um, push folks to park in our parking garages um, when it does come to the longer stays um, is, is something that is that very fine balance for uh, the spots that are on Brand Boulevard or on Central so that um, those spots are more of the in and out as well as the come in, maybe have some dinner, but not the dinner and the show. Um, the dinner and the show uh, is, is kind of the concept of you know, trying to get folks to park in our garages, get validation for four hours where they would only pay one dollar. Um, and so those incentives are, are in place to, to try and mitigate some of the issues that we do see where folks are just, you know, parking on brand and not wanting to move, understanding the convenience of it. Um, our recommendation would be not to change the time frames uh, in terms of length of time on those meters. Again, based on the need to want to have movement on Brand Boulevard and those who are going to be here longer in the garages. Okay. And Mr. Pintero. Um, well, number one, I hope that we uh, take our time in increasing the um, the financial cost uh, park in uh, Glendale, just in general. Uh, but one of the questions I have is, so if we go with some of the proposed fees and they're all enacted, about how much money would we have uh, gained at the end of, say, the first year? Does anyone have a ballpark number? I mean, does the city now get 200,000 more in fees or 500,000 or? But I, I just want to add that my vote for any fee increase is not for revenue. It's to free up those spaces, reach that, yeah. that no, balancing I know, act I know of, that's of what we're after, but I'm, but I'm still curious how much money will the city uh, make with the proposed fee increases. And if you don't have it, I mean, whenever you can put it together, I know it's just going to be an estimate, but we know what we're making now. Correct. Uh, Council Member Quintero, with the, with the items that we had included tonight for increases, it's approximately $700,000 per year that would be, uh, that would be generated additionally. And, and that's broken, broken down, a, and it's on page six of the staff report. In terms of Brand Boulevard on street meters is 200000 In the lots uh, on street meters, so it breaks it down in terms of each one, 450000 Montrose Shopping Park on street meters, approximately $50,000. So, so this is the, I'm sorry, this is the extra revenue that are, we're going to have? Or it's correct increase. This over, is increase over what we're generating now. Oh, okay. Yes, but uh, these fees, this extra, the revenue that's coming in is going to be put right back into Montrose and into uh, the downtown for upkeep and in whatever they they need the money for. Correct? Absolutely, Council Member Devine. The, the the slide that we showed the technologies that are coming. This is what's going to be used to to pay for those technologies and improvements. Back to Mr. Quintero. Yeah. So I feel like I've been through this so many times. <laughs> uh, That's wisdom. That's wisdom speaking, yeah. Mr. Quintero. <laughs> <Yeah>. Wisdom. <laughs> Whatever. But uh, anyway, the presentation was great. I think you all organized it really, uh, organized it really well. Um, but I do hope that we ease into it, especially for the employee parking at the city uh, parking structures here in uh, Glendale. And it may apply in uh, Montrose also. I mean, you know, people work in smaller businesses. They park in these structures, and I'd hate to have them have their fees increased, you know, too quickly. Um, the license plate technology, that's the first I hear of it, and I think it's great. That would really be something if we could uh, could get that done. And then what I think is super important, 
is the space available signs, especially on Grand and Central, the entrances into the uh, downtown. I think that would really, really make a big uh, difference to out-of-towners or even Glendale residents. You look up there and see a number attached to a parking garage, and then, well, let me just drive, let me drive over there. Uh, and then I'm still not satisfied with the signage for the Orange Street Garage and for all uh, the rest of them. I, I'm constantly inviting people to come to Glendale, to come to the restaurants on brand. I still kind of have to describe on the phone, well, it's here and there, and, you know, people are interesting. They may have been to Glendale four or five times and asked me, where is that uh, parking structure again? So I don't know. I think the more signs we have, even if they're somewhat tacky and obtrusive, but the more parking way bearing signs that we have, the better off we are. But the idea of having the numbers attached to... Uh, to some of the, um, you know, sort of key entrances into the downtown, I think is uh, is great. Yeah. <coughs> Any other comments? No, um, Let me go to them yeah. first. And then, oh, sure. Uh, no, no. I, oh, okay. I I just want to say thank you for for the um, the study. Um, I attended the outreach, one of the outreach meetings up in the, uh, the Montrose area. It was well attended. Um, uh, it was great information. Uh, it, I think it's really important just to, to learn from this what outreach can do, what talking to each other can do, what community working together can accomplish. And uh, so I'm anxious to see how this works out. And, uh, um, you know, it uh, right now looks good on paper. Let's see how it works out in the, in the community. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Carpeccia. Yes, uh, question regarding reserved parking fees, $2. Is this for valet parkings, or is these are the monthly parkings that the people have to pay? Uh, Councilmember Garpetti, it's typically for valet parking. It's also for um, I events and that type of thing as well, so special events. And, and we price it the same as the highest price meters in the city for being okay. reserved. So as the rate went up on brand to $2, that's why that rate followed. And uh, for monthly parks, is, is there is there a change in people who buy monthly pass and for for parking structures? Uh, because we were moving to the tiered pricing, we were trying to hold off on any of the rates in the garages, yeah. even though we recognize that they're underutilized. Uh, any of the rate increases that do wind up pushing customers in or expanded theater validation or any of that will hopefully happen in the garages so that we can encourage people there. The monthly parking is also discounted in the garages for employees. So, right, so that, that's what I was going to say. And those I don't rates want are that staying to be increased the same. because the employees will park there. So. Yes. All right. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay, so um, if there's no other questions or comments on that, the uh, item. 8A1. But one, one last question. Was yes. How, I want to ask my yes, colleagues, yes, how yes. do you feel about the 12 a.m. versus 10, 10 p.m.? Uh, Parking pers for personally, I'm okay with the understanding that if it's causing problems, it's, I mean, those, Brand Boulevard is pretty packed till at least 10, 11, 12. Till two. I mean, it goes, it, it goes even mm. further, and and with the street vendor activity, we're going to be having. We'll be swamped. We'll be swamped. <laughs> I mean, okay with it, but to be honest, I'm. Uh, it's sort of like a leap of faith. I I don't know for sure that it'll be uh, the best adjustment. If it's not. Uh, we can I, we can come I, back and mess. I think with. if you leave it at ten and see if you want to adjust it up later, that's that's better. It's, it's too excessive. Twelve a.m. I mean, uh, I haven't seen anywhere that you have to park, uh, pay for streets, and even Pasadena doesn't have it. Twelve a.m. I think it's a little bit. I don't. Know, I think it's a little bit too excessive. Twelve a.m. Yeah, is. Do you have a comment on that? Uh, what well, we did, we just start? shifted because we were taking away two hours in the morning. So all we were doing was taking those hours and no, adding to the. We were doing it based on the occupancy levels, um, and and in the report, it's uh, we don't have the uh, slide up right now, but there was one that showed that during the weekends, it's 
over 80% all the way through 11 p.m. So, so it is full during those hours at night. There are a few other cities that are charging until midnight and 2 a.m., not necessarily ones that are close to us, but I know some of the beach communities and everywhere else are, are adjusting are their hours different. later because but of the only on the weekends, so. if you have 80%, that means you have 20% that is not occupied. So, you know, sometimes I, I think 12 a.m. is too excessive. Right? I mean, I, okay. well, I, uh, I'm willing to give it a try, but it's, I mean, it's not a huge... Uh, but I'm also willing to keep an open mind to, to readjust it if it becomes. Uh, Are we ready to move the item? I'm I'm ready at uh, 8A1 is the motion approving the strategies, uh, two is the resolution, and three is an introduction. Can you take one and two together or separately? Okay. Would you like to move 8A1 and 2? Sure. 1 and 2. I'll second it. I'm sorry, 8A1 and 2 is the fee structures. Let me just get back to my It's the strategies. 1 is the strategies. Is the hours in there as well? 2 are the hours. 8A2 are the hours. Okay. Roll call, please. You want to take it separately because I'm not going to. Okay, let's take 8A1. Yeah. I'll move 8A1. Second. Council Member Agajanian? Yes. Divine? Yes. Garpetian? Yes. Quintero? Yes. Mayor Najarian? Yes. Let's and do 8A2. Again, eight moved two. by Divine, second by second. Agajanian. Uh, Council Member Agajanian? Yes. Divine? Yes. Carpetian? No. Quintero? Yes. Mayor Najarian? Yes. Who would like to introduce the ordinance? I'll introduce the ordinance. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming down and it's a work in progress. There was a recall of the Glendale City Council in the 40s for placing parking meters on brand. I want everyone to know that. Come a long way. So who says this council doesn't take bold action? Uh, next item, please. It's true. It's Director true, of Public Works true. regarding City of Glendale Measure R Sub-Regional Program Update 1 Motion Approving Additional Programming Modifications to Existing Programming and Funding Changes to the Adopted Measure R Sub-Regional Program. Ms. Beers. Yes, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, we'll go to Mr. Amirani, Director of Public Works, and thanks, Metro. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Mayor, uh, members of City Council, uh, this is really a uh, report card for uh, the success we've had with uh, Measure R, and uh, to date we've uh, completed almost $25 million in uh, Measure uh, R Highway Sub-Regional Program funds. Uh, in the uh, staff report, uh, there's a list of these uh, projects that we've completed, and uh, as part of this uh, report, we're asking for, uh, planning on asking for an additional $1.45 million to continue our uh, great work in uh, uh, improving our overall streets and transportation program. Okay. Do we have any cards on this item? Mayor, we do not. Okay. I have a question. Yes, Ms. Devine. Um, we, um, I don't see in the projects to come in the future. Uh, I only see one on uh, cycling, bike stations. There's no other about bike lanes or any other projects concerning bike lanes and bike safety. Can you? Explain that to me, why we don't have more projects. Uh, we do have a bikeway uh, master plan that uh, we work on and uh, with our uh, partners at Community Development. And basically we try to uh, program uh, as we can any project that's coming up uh, with those and we'll uh, continue to do so. We, we do have um, uh, uh, we do have some programs that we've done, uh, for example, the uh, uh, regional uh, bike stations, uh, but uh, we try to come up with these programs as, uh, uh, as they come and try to program in. Uh, we can take a look at adding more uh, of the bike programs in the future. Maybe we get funds from elsewhere for that sort of this, uh, Mr. Mayor, Mayor City Council, Council Member Devine. Uh, typically for uh, bike cycling facilities, we use uh, TDA and TPA um, active transportation uh, grants. 
um, that are outside the Measure R funding mechanism. But with projects that do receive Measure R funding, for example, the street improvement programs, they have bike facilities, bike lanes and sharrows, including those projects that are not specifically spelled out on this list. So there may be facilities embedded in those street improvement projects. So that doesn't mean because they're not here that we're ignoring the, the cyclists and the bike lanes, et cetera. Absolutely okay. right. Thank you. Okay. I'd like to move the item. Second. Second. Uh, if there's no other comments, thank you, Metro, and roll call. <laughs> Council Member Agajanian. Yes. <coughs> Devine. Yes. Garpetian. Yes. Quintero. Yes. Mayor Najarian. Yes. Let's move to 8C, please. Director of Public Works regarding contra uh, contractor services to provide abandoned debris and holiday tree supplemental collection services within the city of Glendale. One, resolution dispensing with competitive bidding and authorizing the purchasing administrator to execute, to execute a purchase order contract with American Reclamation for an amount of $200. $8,618 for one year with the option to extend the purchase order contract for up to two years at 5% annual cost increase totaling $219,049 in, in year two and $230,001 and in year three and rejecting all other proposals. Ms. Beers. Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, um, as uh, our clerk read into the record, we'd like to hire American Reclamation and dis dispense with competitive bidding for a one-year period uh, for an amount not to exceed $208,618 with the option uh, to extend the purchase order contract for up to two years um, and uh, the allowance of 5% annual cost increases so that the totals in year two is 219000 um, and 230000 in year three. With that, Mr. Amrani is available to answer any questions you may have. Oh. Uh, I will go to Mr. Quintero. Well, I think this company's done a very good job throughout the uh, years, so I'll make the uh, motion whenever questions are, are over. I would second. Ready to set. I just have a question. This uh, American Reclamation does our bulky item pickup as well? Yes, that's correct. Okay. We're keeping them busy, I'm sure, with our bulky items. And these are, in addition to the bulky items, the tree and holiday decor. And this is going to continue through because of Armenian Christmas, January 6th, sometime through January, I guess, to give everyone time to get their holiday stuff. Absolutely. Okay. And as you know, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, this supplements uh, the work that our, our current staff does uh, to make sure that we're hitting targeted areas where we do have a lot of dumping that occurs. And this was a directive from the City Council a couple of years ago for us to move forward uh, to make sure that we supplant what we have internally uh, to make sure that we're getting around to all of the, the hard target areas and, and have a cleaner city. Mr. Carpetti. Do we know how many trees do they pick up every year? Last, Last year, year we had a number. I don't know if Mr. Amrani remembers what that number is or Mr. Hardgrove. We had a number last year. It was quite a few. Good evening, uh, Mr. Mayor, members of council. Um, yeah, yeah, we had 8,000, uh, average around 8,000 Christmas trees. Uh, it's it steadily increased over the last few years. 8,000 was, was the most recent number. Okay. It, so, so this this is um, supplementing what the pickup that we had last year. Because I know last year, trees were out there for a long time. It was, it was eight thousand total right, between right. all. Okay. all, all but, but this year, hopefully, we'll have them picked up because of this contract. Yeah, this is this is this will really lend a hand that's in right. kind of in advancing that and getting getting it picked okay, up quickly. That's good. Great. Great. So it's and and, and I, I, I'm sorry. I'm not, is this right? Uh, what Athens was eight hundred and fifty thousand versus two hundred and wow, that that's quite a quite a difference in, in for the same work. Wow. So is it eight thousand trees total, or eight thousand trees picked up by American Reclamation only? Eighteen eight thousand total. So between what we pick up and they pick up combined. Okay, got it. Thank you. And. So that was Mr. Quintero's motion. 
Second. I'll move 8C1. Seconded. Folks, just call in and schedule your bulky item pickup. It's very easy. You can do it over the phone. It's an automated system. And that way your stuff isn't, I mean, there's no shame in it. I put my stuff out there. My wife makes me clean out all my, <laughs> my stuff. <laughs> stuff I would never give away, my easy chair and stuff like that. But um, who knows the number offhand? Eight one eight five four eight three nine one six. Eight one eight five four eight three one nine one six. Three nine one six. Just call and it's very easy and it's a great service that the that the city provides. You don't have to go dump it in some abandoned lot because it's much more difficult to get to uh, and it stays there longer than if you just say it's here at the corner and you put it out on your day of garbage pickup and it's it's gone by the end of the, the day. And, that, and one more, it, not on the street, right? On Because I've seen people dumping on the street, sofas. I think there's one out there now on the street. No, not on the street. Curb. On the curb. curb. On the, and uh, one, one last parkway. question. Mr. Uh, Aguijin. What bothered me, did you say, uh, be, I guess you didn't say it, your uh, colleague said that we pick up only 8,000 trees? 8,000? 8,000. So we pay 200,000 for 8,000? That's 25. No. No, no, no. They also pick up bulky items. Oh, so they, they pick do. up okay. sofas yeah. and before. chairs. That would be and and very yeah. expensive <laughs> proposition. <laughs> yes. Should have taken the vote while, while things were going. Yeah. Roll call. Roll call, please. Councilmember Agajanian. Yes. Devine. Yes. Garpetia. Yes. Quintero. Yes. Mayor Najarian. Yes. Thank you. Next item, please. Director of Public Works regarding contractual sign, paint and thermoplastic road marking maintenance services and motorist, bicyclist and pedestrian safety. One, motion authorizing the purchasing administrator to execute a purchase order contract in the not to exceed amount of one million over five years with Sterndahl Enterprises Incorporated using pricing obtained from a competitively bid contract with the City of Los Angeles on an as-needed basis with two optional one-year extensions at 200000 each. Two would be ro uh, resolution appropriating 130000 Ms. Beers. Yes, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, if there are any questions, Mr. Amrani can give you a, a quick report on this. Paint and thermoplastic purchases. Five years. And this, if I may? Yes. This Ms. is refreshing the, uh, a lot of the sharrows that are kind of faded and lines and things. Refreshing. Okay, good. Limit lines and border lines. And right. Is there a motion? So so I'll, move, I'll move the item. Second. Second. Uh, second. second. Roll call, please. Councilmember Agajanian? Yes. Devine? Yes. Garpetian? Yes. Quintero? Yes. Mayor Najarian? Yes. Next item. He would be Chief of Police and Chief Information Officer regarding Professional Services Agreement, PSA with Central Square Incorporated for the upgrade implementation and software licensing and maintenance of Tiburon, a police computer-aided dispatch and automated records management system. One, motion authorizing the city manager to negotiate and execute an agreement between the city of Glendale and Central Square, Square Incorporated in the amount not to exceed $2,938,660 plus a contingency of $440,799. Two, motion authorizing the city manager to amend the city's existing PSA with Sitcom Incorporated in the amount not to exceed 333500 plus a contingency of $33,350. Ms. Beers. Yes, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, our Police Chief, Carl Povolitis, will take you through a short presentation uh, regarding uh, our recommendation to move forward with Central Square, Inc. Chief. Mr. Mayor, members of Council, uh, Carl Povolitis, Police Chief. Uh, we're here before you today to uh, 
talk about replacing our computer-aided dispatch and records management system. Uh, the current system is about 19 years old. Uh, we're living on borrowed time. It's reached the end of its, its sort of useful life. I remember when we implemented it, so if that gives you a sense of how, how long it's, it's been around. Uh, and a couple of things are happening. Not only do we need to upgrade that system itself, but the federal government is changing out of what we call the Uniform Crime Reports, which has been the traditional way of uh, reporting statistics on crime nationwide and going to the national incident-based uh, reporting system. Uh, and we're supposed to come into compliance by that uh, in 2021. So one of, the, one of the things that we came before you in uh, September of 2018 was to accept a grant for, two, for 832,000, which would help us with this project. In October, we started looking at what we needed to do. By December, uh, we were back before you to issue a uh, RFP to go out and go through the proposals to replace our CAD RMS system. Uh, in February, we got three responses back. The three vendors were Central Square, Mark 43, and uh, Tyler. Uh, Tyler does not, is not criminal justice information system compliant, which is an FBI standard for exchanging information, and they will not guarantee that. Neither do they have an active jail module, which we obviously need, and some of their other modules are not functional. So at that point, we took them out of contention and proceeded with the other two most qualified candidates to, uh, to look at them. We actually do a multi-stage process. Uh, the initial stage, we looked at the paper RFPs. Then we asked the vendors to come in and give us demonstrations, you know, kind of see how the scores change here as we go on. But I'm going to tell you, this is a far-reaching product. It touches every corner of the police department from, you know, our 911 center to our record center to our property to our jail. So before we really go forward, one of the things we did is we do site visits. We had a project team of 19 people who are evaluating this. This is a multidisciplinary team from within the department that's looking at this to make sure we get the best solution possible for the department. So where you see there, we actually went out to four different agencies, two for each one of the products, actually looked at them, asked them to demonstrate it, going, how do we do this? Let's see how this actually works. Uh, and so you can see where that goes. And then once we got through that process, we asked people to come back with their best and final offers. Uh, and that's where we came out. Uh, ultimately, you can see that for through that process, Central Square is the product that seems to best represent the uh, represent the department. So when the best and final offers came in, Central Square was about two point nine million dollars, which is you know one point six million, a little over that in the initial software and implementation. Uh, and then we have maintenance recurring out for four years, and that would total up to about one point two eight million. Tyler had come in at two million dollars on the initial software purchase, and about one point five million in recurring costs on the four years out. Uh, so ultimately, we're looking at 16 different categories uh, in the process in depth of what their cost is, how well they can negotiate, uh, what their ability to uh, meet our needs are, the hardware costs that would be associated with this, um, the implementation, and for us, data conversion is a, a big issue because we have lots of data uh, and we would like to keep as much as, as we can. And ultimately, again, in this process, not only did Central uh, Square come out being the least expensive product for it, it also comes out being the product that looks like it best fits our operation as a, uh, as a department. So the project team recommended to myself and to the uh, Director of Information Services that Central Care would be it. It's the highest scoring proposal. It is our existing vendor, which may make the data conversion so we can get full data conversion at no additional cost. It is our lowest cost. And when we looked at the other agencies, it looks like it works and will work within, uh, uh, within our organization. If council uh, approves our recommendation this evening, uh, we're looking at trying to be, in order to meet some of the grant deadlines, we're looking to kick this off and be under contract by January of 2020. We obviously have a lot of work to do in, in between that process of looking at our business analysis, our business processes, making sure everything fits, getting all the software and so forth and moving our data over, testing it, making sure it works. Then we have to train everybody. Um, and said this will be this will be a major undertaking for us and a multi-year undertaking. We have to train everybody else, and we're looking that to, to go live in April of 2021. So we're going to have you know just a little under a two-year implementation uh, process. So we're respectfully asking council for two things tonight. One is to enter into a contract not to exceed the amount of two thousand nine hundred and thirty-eight six hundred and sixty dollars with Central Square with a fifteen percent contingency of four hundred and forty thousand seven hundred ninety-nine dollars, and that will do the main product. 
but we also need some help in implementing it. We do not have the staff on site to do this all by ourselves, and I said this will be a major complex undertaking. Uh, SITCOM has been assisting us with this RFP process. We are also asking uh, your approval to amend their contract uh, in an amount not to exceed $333,500 plus a 10% contingency of $33,350. What that will get us is two people full time uh, to be on site to get us through the process of negotiating the contracts, implementing, training, and going live with this. And we think from once, once we've gotten to that point, we'll be able to transition back to, to our staff. Uh, with that, that would conclude my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions. I'll Just, move the item. I, I'm sorry. Second. I have, I'll second. Um, Mr. Ecker, Jr. I, as usual, I have concerns that there is only, actually, there is three companies came forward for a contract <clears throat> up to amount of three million dollars we have only two companies that they came actually forward the third one you said or whoever wrote this up information says was not satisfactory I mean I'm really surprised that the contract of three million dollars in the entire United States, there is only two companies that come forward. That bothers me. I, I will date myself a little bit. Uh, there are not that many companies that do this product. So when you look at policing agencies and different sizes, there are not that many. And then I'm going to date myself because I'm going to go kind of like Pac-Man. A lot of these companies have been bought up by other companies. So if you go out to other departments, they'll go, oh, well, we have X brand and then that brand has been bought up by a holding company or another company or been brought together to try and amalgamate them into a, a complete and total solution for a police department. Um, Motorola did not bid on this contract, though traditionally Motorola is generally incredibly expensive and would be seven million or several million dollars probably more than what is in this budget. I think there was one other that we thought might but elected not to come into the, into the process. But the universe of, of companies that make uh, CAD RMS software is is not that large, and so we, we got the main players into into this process. Thank you, Mr. Quintero. What other Southern California agencies use this product? I believe on this one, Orange County Sheriff's is using this product, and that's one of the ones we looked at. And then we looked at Colorado. We're actually on a, a legacy, if you will, a legacy older system uh, that uh, Tiburon system that Central Square now owns, and so it's newer, but they are in place, and it is a proven product. And so Orange County had no issues. They came came out with. As I said we actually sent people out on site to go look at this. Uh, very happy with uh, very happy with the systems, uh, and our people were happy with what they saw. Uh, Chief, so I have a question. Uh, you don't think that this system tries to do too much? I mean, the things you were saying. It, it's all integrated, and it's dispatch, and it's records, and it's. Is that, is there any danger, do you see any danger in that uh, it's just perhaps should be more decentralized than just this massive server and software that's doing everything for us? In order to make this system work for us, the, the parts need to communicate with each, with each other. And so everybody has built, um, all, of, all of the competitors have built a solution where they're doing that. So. For instance, if, if, if I arrest somebody and I book somebody, then I need that booking module to talk to our report writing module so that I'm not double entering all that information. Uh, as I said, I go back to the days on paper. We would take a booking sheet, then I've got to transfer all that information to written form, and then if we had a computer system, our records folk would have to take that and put that into the, into the computer system. So there's a lot of data entry. So the idea of having an integrated solution is each of these modules talks to each other, and it eliminates the duplication of work and makes our resources a little bit more efficient. Okay. Uh, I don't have any cards on this item. There is, Mayor, there is one card, Herbert Milano. Uh, Just... Is that on this item, on yeah. 8E? Yeah. Hold on, I'm sorry. I had my consent candle and calendar in front. Um, Herbert Milano. Good evening, Mayor Nigerian, members of the City Council. My name is Herbert Molano. 
It was not my intent, believe me, to speak on any subject other than the oral communications. But I was, as I was listening to this, I thought I could provide some valuable input for you. I spent over 30 years implementing large systems in what we would call mid-sized companies of about $2 billion. Our company installed about 200 systems in manufacturing complete. But something that you should know is that around 65% of systems implementations fail, meaning they fail to achieve their objectives, and the cost overruns are incredibly common. Now, I'm not, I don't know the level of effort that was done, and I'm not talking uh, in any way negatively with regard to the chief of police, but I just wondered if they are aware of any other systems cost overruns in other cities, what was the transition that was made from what software to what software they were doing it. The, um, the likelihood is very high that this thing, especially if there are not enough individuals who have been experienced systems conversions, the chances for a cost overrun could be very high. And, um, and I, just, I just mentioned this to you from my experience of 30 years in systems that oftentimes uh, that due diligence is really, really crucial. Perhaps the, the police has done it, but when you don't have a system implementation in the past 20 years, like a full transition, it could be a very, very costly experience. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, if I can um, uh, state something on the record in, in response to what Mr. Milano said, and he's absolutely right. It, it can be very detrimental to an organization. Uh, but this organization just implemented the, the Munis system, as, as you're all aware. We went from Oracle, PeopleSoft, to, to Munis. And, and I have to say, having been through both uh, implementations, PeopleSoft and, and now Oracle, uh, and now Munis, excuse me, uh, the process was quite different this time around. Why? Because we had the right people around the table uh, and the right consultants so that we didn't have cost overruns and the implementation was uh, as smooth as can be. And Glendale is being utilized by other cities in terms of that model uh, of cities for implementation of large systems. I would hope uh, and my expectation of the staff, uh, both in the police department and information services department, Jason Bradford, is that we would experience the same thing with this implementation. And we have the same team of folks uh, from IS D, who are uh, supporting the police department in this process. The people's office was a disaster. It was difficult. It was, but, it was quite difficult. But we're hoping that, that we're going to... Over 20 years ago. <laughs> over 20 years ago. Yeah. It has not moved. I have moved the item. Oh, Roll call, please. Council Member Agajanya. Yes. Devine. Yes. Carpetian. Yes. Pintero. Yes. Mayor Najarian. Yes. 8F, please. City Attorney and Director of Community Development regarding consideration of an urgency ordinance of the City of Glendale, California, establishing a sidewalk vending program in compliance with Senate Bill Number 946, amending the Glendale Municipal Code 1995, adding Chapter 5.35, and amending Sections 1. 0.20.10 and 9.14.140 and declaring the urgency thereof, urgency ordinance for introduction. Mr. Mayor. Before we go to Mr. Garcia, I want to thank you for working uh, so uh, diligently to get this to us. This was just two weeks ago, I think we were yes, sir, discussing it, and we wanted to move on this forthwith. And I know you guys have a lot of other items that you're dealing with, but I do appreciate getting it to us at this Certainly, time. and I, then I have to thank my staff, especially Carmen Marino, for basically doing all the legwork to get this done. So thank you. With that, sure, thank you very much for that, Mayor. Uh, we appreciate that. Uh, as you noted, we were here on the 22nd of October uh, getting direction from the Council regarding uh, Senate Bill 946 and sidewalk vendors. Uh, as we discussed, Senate Bill 946, SB 946, um, imposes requirements on local agencies, cities, and counties regarding um, sidewalk vendors and, and providing a permit process for them to operate in, in cities within certain regulations that cities are still authorized to enact. So the ordinance before you, uh, which is proposed or brought to you as a proposed urgency ordinance per your direction, uh, would uh, add Chapter 5.35 to the code 
as well as amend the sections regarding the, the penalties uh, for administrative citations and, and criminal, criminal uh, enforcement, as well as uh, modifying or eliminating certain provisions of our existing pedler permit process. So the, the code will, as amended, will um, obviously uh, authorize and regulate sidewalk vending or sidewalk vendors, uh, which are persons who sell food and merchandise um, from these types of vehicles, uh, non-motorized vehicles, uh, and specifically within the sidewalk uh, or other pedestrian path, but not within other, other publicly owned prop uh, properties, including uh, alleys or plazas or city-owned parking lots or structures. So this will only apply to sidewalks or paved pedestrian paths and not to streets or any, anything of that nature. Um, so the first part of the ordinance uh, that I'll discuss is a, a requirement that uh, the city would impose a, an annual license requirement for sidewalk vendors. Uh, SB 946 does permit cities to uh, require a permit and uh, impose penalties for not, not, not uh, having a permit. So as proposed, the ordinance would require a separate license for each receptacle, so a vendor who is has more than one receptacle or cart that they're using to sell uh, food or merchandise would be required to uh, obtain a license for that uh, particular um, uh, receptacle. In addition, uh, the application will include an application fee. Uh, and I, I do apologize, our initial estimate in the report that was presented to you uh, on this item indicated that it would be around the range of $233. Um, that's that was based on the existing peddling fee as we as we looked, as finance looked through the, the costs that would be incurred to process this particular permit, um, the, the estimate that we have is $598 for a permit fee for sidewalk vending. Uh, council is not required to adopt the fee at that rate, but that's what is, um, that is justified by our fee study on this, on this particular matter. The applicants will also be required to obtain their uh, California sales tax number, provide a map where their, their, their vending, uh, their sidewalk vending uh, receptacle will be located for a stationary uh, vending uh, machine or receptacle, uh, as well as provide details regarding the equipment that they propose to use. Councilmember Rajani. Uh, go back to, you say application fee it's a permit fee, actually. It's probably right. but yeah. No, the point the application, the person should have like some sort of ID. The, one of the requirements will be that they provide either a California driver's license or California. Uh, it doesn't say there. I didn't put it. In, I didn't put every single requirement um, in the PowerPoint, but it is. It is noted in the in the ordinance and the report that they'll be required to provide either California driver's license or California. Um, uh, identification, or I think there's a third one, but some and sort we'll of check their background. Correct. And Somebody and then, can bring something and sell and damage everybody, every buyer here. Like say they sell things. If you don't know who the person is, will be very dangerous. Correct. So they'll be required to provide proof of identification. In addition, they're also going to be required to. Uh, okay. And more. Right. And in, more. in addition, um, they will be required to submit a, f a fingerprint uh, analysis. They'll provide, they provide. They will get the certified f fingerprint right. analysis. The, the record will be submitted to to the city for review. Uh, and then, if the applicant has a criminal conviction that requires a register registration as a, a sex offender or is uh, convicted of a crime pertaining to narcotics, that will be grounds for denial of the license for that particular applicant. Applicants also be required to obtain their obtain and show proof of their county health permit in the event that they're selling food from their uh, receptacle. Um, one of the additional requirements that's currently in the ordinance, uh, I know there wasn't consensus on this, but it's it's in the ordinance now would require applicants to provide proof of insurance, including uh, making the city additional insured on that, and it would be for a million dollars per occurrence combined single, single limit with a $2 million aggregate. That's what's in there now, you know, obviously, I know there's gonna be some future discussion on that. And in part with the insurance requirement would be a requirement that the applicant indemnify uh, the city for any, any acts or missions related to their use of, of the uh, sidewalk vending equipment in the right of way. So some of the operating requirements that are included within the ordinance, uh, the first one being hours of operation. So within exclusively residential zones, which mean those zones, those properties within zones that are zoned either single family or multifamily exclusively, um, the hours will be from dawn to dusk. 
um, if in non-residential zones, so basically everything else, commercial mixed use zones, industrial zones, the hours that will be prohibited is from 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. And if you recall, we talked about this, cities are allowed to adopt reasonable hours of operation. However, those hours cannot be more strict than the city imposes on other businesses. And, and the city doesn't really have hours of operation requirements that are adopted legislatively for businesses in commercial zones. So therefore, we think that the fairest approach is to have a ban from 2 a.m. to 6 a.m., which is when most businesses would, all businesses would likely be closed, closed regardless of the type. Um, in addition, the hours of operation in parks, city parks where they're allowed to operate would be, they'd be required to uh, close one hour before the park closed, the posted park closing time. In addition, there's a, a number of sa safety and sanitation requirements in, in the ordinance. Just a couple of the, of the key points um, in the ordinance. Um, it, obviously, a, a requirement that there be no explosive or hazardous materials, uh, with the exception of the use of propane, so there will be no open flame uh, in any food cart that's being used in the right of way. In addition, vendors will be required to maintain their own trash containers uh, when they are providing food and not dump their trash in the city tr public trash cans that, that might exist in the right of way. And in addition, there's obviously cleaning requirements for, for food, food vendors before they depart for the day or the depart from their use of the street on a particular day, they'd be required to make sure that their site is clean and they, they clean the area of any trash, debris, or, or grease, or anything of that nature. So for the receptacle requirements, the, the requirements for the carts themselves, so to speak, the minimum or the maximum dimensions will be six feet uh, long and four feet wide. In addition, for roaming vendors, um, the, they must maintain at all times an unobstructed view of four feet from the ground to the top of the, the serving area of the cart, whether it's a food vendor or merchandise. So that's to, obviously for a roaming vendor, that's to make sure that they, when they're pushing their cart, they can, somebody, they can see who's in front of them and, and avoid uh, safety hazards in that regard. Um, I'd also add a couple of things that are not in the PowerPoint but are in the ordinance. Um, the uh, vendors will not be able to rent merchandise from their, their receptacle. They will not be able to sell certain prohibited goods such as alcohol, marijuana products, nicotine products. Um, any advertisement display can only be um, advertisement for goods that are sold from that particular receptacle and no other goods. Um, they will not be allowed to sell services from a, uh, a vending cart. Uh, and in addition, they will, any um, merchandise or food um, must be affixed or inside the receptacle. They can't be outside, can't be stored on the floor, or anything of that nature. Um, and any advertisement, again, must also be affixed to the, to the cart and can't be, there can't be a separate A-frame, for example, that's somewhere else on the street indicating someone to go to a, to a vendor. Um, so another uh, key operating requirement that we talked about the last time was um, regard to minimum sidewalk width for uh, sidewalk vending. So what we've proposed in line with some of the other cities is to have a minimum 10-foot minimum width in commercial areas or other non-residential zones, as well as a 5-foot minimum unobstructed area of public walkway. So in our commercial zones, that's, that's uh, mostly you know, attainable. Most of our sidewalks meet those, those requirements. Um, and so that's, that's sort of balancing the, the ability to engage in this business with obviously making sure there's safe walking distances uh, on the commercial rights of way. And in exclusively residential zones, um, we're proposing a, for roaming vendors that they maintain a four feet unobstructed public walkway. Again, the stationary vendors will not be allowed in exclusively residential zones, so that requirement will not need to be applied. In addition, any vendors will also be, be required to comply with any other applicable ADA requirements. So if there's a particular area where there's just no ADA access, then the staff will obviously have the authority to enforce and make sure that there's there's, you know, if, there's a, if a vendor is blocking the access to a, an ADA compliant um, curb cut, for example, um, that, that it would be enforced in that manner. Um, we talk, I talked about this a little bit in the definition of sidewalk. Again, vending will not be allowed on any other public property other than the public sidewalks and, and on paved pedestrian walkways in our parks. Uh, that includes City Hall and a city library unless there's an agreement with the city at the Civic Auditorium and, like I said, the, the parking structures and the parking lots. Some prohibited, prohibited zones uh, for uh, sidewalk vending. I already talked about the stationary vendors in exclusive residential zones will not be permitted. 
In addition, and this was the discussion we had, council asked to look at some certain areas where there's high pedestrian activity, where it's been identified, easy, easy, easily identified, easy to document. So in the Arts and Entertainment District, in the Alex Theater District, um, and portions of Brandon Central, so Brand from Colorado to Lexington, and Central from Colorado to uh, that the bridge, the Galleria Bridge, uh, just north of, of that, uh, that parking structure there as well as the Montreal Shopping Park area, Kenneth Village, and Adams Square. Uh, sidewalk vending would not be prohibited given the amount of pedestrian activity, uh, potential risk associated with um, interaction with pedestrians and, and vehicles coming in and out of, of many of these places. Um, that's part of the recommendation before you. Some other pro prohibited locations, and we talked about this, obviously the, the state law pro allows the city to prohibit um, um, vendors within the immediate vicinity of farmers markets or special events and the council directed that that be 500 feet so that's in there there's a ban from operating within 200 feet of police stations fire stations hospitals or schools when they're open from 8 a.m to 5 p.m um, some of the other requirements 10 feet from bus stops and bus shelters um, street corners crosswalks and dry driveway and alley approaches some of the other uh, discussion points on prohibited locations um, a recommendation that there be a certain distance between vendors and what we propose in 100 feet from another vendor so a sidewalk vendor would not be uh, permitted to operate within 100 feet of another vendor this will likely be easier to enforce in the context of the stationary vendors but it will apply technically across the board with respect to entrances of businesses we're proposing a 10-foot um, distance between um, a sidewalk vending operation and entrance to any business as well as 10 feet between sidewalk vendor and any side outdoor dining area and then three feet between a sidewalk vendor and any uh, display window uh, that would would inter interfere with the ability to see the, the storefront window the state law also requires um, cities to allow vending in parks um, and so a couple of um, w what allows us to in some cases exclude them when we have exclusive concession agreements as well as to impose some additional time place manner restrictions so um, there are a few uh, uh, concession agreements that we have at the sports complex and then also Pacific and Montrose Park and there may be some others actually I got some information today there might be some others that, that it would be stationary vending would be prohibited those as well uh, vendors again it would be prohibited to cease operations one hour before park closing they're gonna have to stay on the, on the pedestrian the paved pedestrian walkways within the parks and they're gonna have to remain 50 feet or more away from any field or court or playground when those facilities are, are in use uh, we discussed a little bit more detail last time about the appeal procedures that we have to have the penalties will be what the it's based on state law it'll be 100 200 500 and then for it's a slightly higher scale for uh, not ha not operating without a permit at all that's a slightly higher scale we impose we put both of those in in the ordinance and then there will be some resolutions coming back to you in two weeks uh, that will include those as well um, and then we talked about there has to be some ability to pay uh, appeal determinations that that folks who cannot afford to pay the administrative citations will be able to seek relief from and we discussed that in a little bit more detail last time, but happy to answer questions about it. So that's the general scope of the ordinance. Um, again, it, it's before you tonight for introduction. We'll bring it back on the 19th. If the council wants to adopt on an urgency basis, we have urgency findings for you uh, in the ordinance that will require four fifths vote. Um, and we'll, you know, we'll bring back the fee resolution that I discussed and the other item, and that'll be before you on the 19th. So I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. I know that there are a couple comments uh, folks want to talk about. I do have two cards. Let's hear from the public first. Uh, Lyric Kelkar. Hi, good evening. Uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. My name is Lyric Kelker and I'm a Glendale resident. Uh, I'm also a policy analyst and I do a lot of work around sidewalk vending in the Los Angeles region generally. I appreciate the work of the Council staff in looking into and proposing an urgent ordinance to regulate sidewalk vending. However, I encourage you to strike some of the most restrictive pieces of the proposed ordinance. 
The ones that I, I believe are most restrictive are number one, the background check. The background check requirement, because it is restrict, er, it's restrictive because it creates a barrier to entry that could discourage vendors for, from becoming a part of the formal economic system here in Glendale. Um, the next is the 100 foot, bet the 100 foot buffer between uh, vendors because it highly limits the places in which people are able to vend and that on top of the the no vend zones that have been established throughout Glendale it makes it very difficult for vendors finally the nearly $600 fee is extremely high for vendors and is yet another large barrier to entry other permits from the county can total over a thousand dollars annually and um, that's on top of the cost of running their own small businesses. I've surveyed many vendors throughout the Los Angeles region and the vast majority are comfortable with paying 50 to $200 annually typically. Uh, I encourage the council to consider working with vendors and other small business owners in establishing regulations that make sense for all of the stakeholders. Uh, the low barrier to entry for sidewalk vending encourages entrepreneurship and vendors are small business owners looking to make a living for themselves and their families. There's also a body of research that shows that um, vendors encourage economic vitality at all levels and increase foot traffic in commercial areas. Proving it proves that they're helpful to all businesses in the area. Um, restricting them in unnecessary ways is harmful to the program overall and creates further barriers to economic mo mobility generally. Thank you for your time. Thank you. The next card is from Marco from the Greater Downtown Glendale Association. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I want to thank the City Council and the City Attorney's Office for coming back so quickly with this ordinance. It's very, very comprehensive. Um, I know that you've already received the letter from the President Rick Lemo, who had a conflict and could not be here tonight but he wanted to express our full support for the ordinance. I would only make one addition to the ordinance and that's in section 5.35.030, uh, subsections 10 and 11. The concern that we have, and I think it's been um, borne out in other areas, is the insurance liability. That if someone, for whatever reason, decides to sue the city or someone is damaged or they're injured, by a sidewalk vendor, they normally will not go after the sidewalk vendor, they'll go after the deep pockets. The deep pocket will be the city of Glendale. But we'd also like the Downtown Glendale Association and I think our cohorts in the Montrose District to have their corporation also um, additionally insured. Because if they can't get, and this has happened in San Diego many times, uh, in the public rights of way where the D district management corporation has been sued. So I think that the overall body of work is extremely well done and I'm glad that it was expedited and I want to thank you again the city attorney for doing so and staff. But I would just ask this council to consider additionally insured for the downtown Glendale Association and for the Montrose District too. Thank you. Okay, I don't have any other cards. Okay, so Mr. Quintero, I know go uh, first. you've got some um, thoughts on this. All right, so we have a comprehensive ordinance that's going to severely restrict vending in the city, geographically and multiple other ways of keeping vendors from coming to, uh, to the city. Um, and just for the record, uh, Mr. Lemo talked about a couple of vendors. I mean, in terms of this is such an emergency, it's such a rush, we have to do it tonight, uh, he talked about a couple of vendors near the Americana selling some sort of little trinkets for kids. Then we have a uh, uh, someone, a vendor, selling hot dogs in front of the long-established um, uh, Giggles, a uh, nightclub, and that I know of, there's absolutely no police reports of any sort that have been filed, no no issues have been reported so far. And at this point, anyone can come to Glendale and be a vendor. So I just don't believe that there's going to be hordes of vendors coming to this city in the future. But in the event that, that lots of folks decide that Glendale is where they want to set up their vendors, without question, this is comprehensive, it's restrictive, this ordinance will do the job in severely restricting uh, those vendors' ability to, to earn a living. Um, I'll go ahead and support it. However, I won't 
support this insurance uh, liability uh, for two million dollars I believe is the number that we're looking at the city attorney has said a number of times that a vendor or someone who's injured by vending activity will not succeed in suing the city of Glendale am I correct in in assuming that that in fact so far we are we're fine we're not going to be sued by uh, Mr. Mayor, mem members of council, I, what I said was, and, and that's correct, is that you know, by merely issuing a permit to engage for a private actor to engage in, in some business, that does not create liability for the city. Um, in addition, there's actually an immunity for permit-related activity. Um, and as an attorney, though, I always say, but that doesn't mean we won't get sued. And yeah, I think that's yeah, Mr. Lemanji's point. All the time and, and, and so, the but that's truly a policy call, and 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 I. And I you know, the legislative purpose of the bill, SB 946, does speak to the issue of um, uh, not not putting up barriers to, to get into this type of business. So. Right. So the Montrose Shopping Park or the Downtown Glendale uh, Business Association, the bid, doesn't have to worry about uh, being sued. So I'll support the ordinance, but in the event that this insurance uh, requirement sticks, then I absolutely won't. Well, I'll, I'll jump in. I think the um, I think the one million per occurrence and two million total. I think that's what the the requirement is. Is a little excessive. Uh, I do think they should have some sort of insurance. I'm, um, I mean, a million is a lot of insurance. That's that's going to be very expensive. Um, I'm not sure what the levels of liability, the steps of liability. Uh, insurance coverage are um, I imagine it's at a you know 100 250 500 maybe and then maybe it goes to a million and of there there's certainly other, other other ranges and that's typical for a contractor permit to have a million two million um, and there are you know a couple other ways to slice it one is council can decide you know not to do it council can decide a lower number on the on the limits uh, what we see another city has done is um, have an insurance requirement, but leave it up to the city's risk manager to determine what the appropriate amount is, based on experience and what claims and all that stuff. They kind of see what's what's appropriate, what's what's the average in the market. That's another way to do it. Um, well, let's see how. Uh, are you for no insurance at all? I'm, I'm for no insurance at all. If the city attorney tells us that in fact we're not uh, liable, and the state law, I guess, addresses this. There, well, not this particular state law, but this, the state law in general right. regarding regarding right. liability for public agencies. Right. So, no, we're and, you know, over. I mean, yeah. there are a lot of things that we do that we require. I mean, in fairness to the other side of the argument, there are a lot of things that we require insurance for that we, you know, technically are not not liable for. It's it's a matter of risk, and if I think, I I would probably be pushing for some insurance requirement if there weren't these immunities under state law, and if the 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 law didn't have this language in there about. Um, not not putting up barriers to get into this business. Let me ask a question. When we had all these street protests for the uh, Armenian uh, revolution, did we ask them for any insurance? No. I did not. In I mean, fact, those we were didn't, thousands didn't, of people. They didn't get a permit, but presumably. Yeah. Uh, okay. I'm just sort of putting it together. Uh, I, I, I have Ms. a. Ms. Devine. Thank you. And then I, Ms. I have. Ragazzini. Okay. I have a. If we are too prohibitive, are we opening ourselves up for a lawsuit? Well. It, Yes, but I'm not sure. I don't know that the one million, two million limit is too prohibitive because it's it, it it is a common permit, not an uncommon permit condition in other contexts. So, um, but this is the only law that says don't put up barriers to getting into this business. So that's that's why I point I'm, that I'm out. I'm talking about like a like, cumulative effect, like correct. If we had a lot of other things, I think. But again, I think our ordinance complies with with the law. It mirrors a lot of other provisions that other cities in our region, as, as we talked about last time, uh, have in their ordinances. So I think we're on solid ground there. I just, you know, usually, you know, as the lawyer, I'm the one saying we should have insurance and all that. And I, I feel like it doesn't need to be in there if the council doesn't feel that it wants to have well, it. I, I feel that, um, uh, I, I also feel that that $600 is too much um, to ask. Uh, um, you know, the I, I think that uh, 
these are people that could, uh, you know, they're they're trying to just trying to to make a living to scrape by, and and I think that would be really prohibitive, and I I don't care for that. Um, so I would I'd be in favor of something like 200, 250. Um, I also think the insurance is is uh, is not necessary, and again, very prohibitive, a barrier uh, for them. Um, I think our main concern is to keep them away, uh, or to not keep them away, but to make sure that our businesses uh, are not uh, impacted in a negative way, our marketplaces are not impacted in a negative way, and I think that is more about a location uh, issue. Um, I, I am also for the background check. I, I, I am for that. I, I know that uh, the young lady uh, mentioned that that was uh, a barrier, but I, I am I, I'm going to stick by that. Um, so um, other than that, those comments, that's uh, the way I feel about this. On the insurance, as has been mentioned, $1 million and $2 million aggregate is unbelievably high insurance. I'm not sure even the stores, they have such a high number of, I mean, $1 million and $2 million aggregate insurance. This is too much in my opinion. But I can go ahead with some sort of insurance, like 100000 and 250 or 200000 aggregate, which will be very small figure to protect themselves. The vendor will protect himself too if they buy an insurance. So I would suggest 100000 and 200000 which will be very small amount to purchase such an insurance. That's my suggestion. Mr. Garbett, I have a couple of comments and maybe a couple of questions, and I get to the insurance part. Um, the prohibited areas and zones that you mentioned, you know, part of downtown and central and everything, are these only for stationary vendors, or it applies to roaming vendors as well? It applies to roaming vendors as well, both vendor, both sets of vendors. For both of them? <laughs> yes, sir. Okay. Um, and that idea of 100 feet being 100 feet away from each other, does that apply to our parks as well or not? That particular stationary? requirement, the 100, the 100 foot between, between vendors, yes. So if you have, I don't know, because Verdugo Park has I don't know, 1,100 right. feet, maybe more than that, frontage on, on Verdugo Boulevard, if I'm not mistaken, on, on Kenyatta, so they can have eight or ten of them in there? Is that what it is? Assuming they meet the other standards uh, of the code in terms of sidewalk width, um, and assume that they're not, um, they're on pedestrian walkways, so either the sidewalk actually on Kenyatta or you know, one of the pedestrian walkways. Um, and in addition, um, the, you know, there's a requirement that they not be within 50 feet of playgrounds, and, and I'm not sure the ball field one will apply, but the other ones would. Okay. Um, also, the the ten feet away from bus stops and entrances to businesses and uh, an area permitted for outside dining could that be fifteen feet? Is that is fifteen feet too excessive in your opinion? Because ten feet is from here to there, from here to where Masago John is. I mean, you're. I think it's probably reasonable. Okay, I would I would suggest that to be 15 feet. That's my opinion. We'll have to see if there is support for it or not. And also, we didn't talk about the do they allow to have am amplified music, or they have they can have some sort of music. Any amplified sound would require an amplified sound permit, um, and uh, but yeah, that that'd be a separate process. How about outdoor seating? Are they allowed to have outdoor seating? No. And no other umbrellas or you know easy ups or anything like that. It has to be self-contained within the receptacle. I don't know. I'm. I'm I know that there is a there is a the idea is to have entrepreneurship and everything. Part of being an entrepreneur is. Uh, starting a business is the cost that comes with it. I mean, 
you go rent an office building, you have to pay rent, you have to pay the electricity, you have to pay for your insurance, and it is a million dollar insurance to ask for you, for a little dingy office you, you, you rent to start a business. I, I understand the, the, the positive uh, aspect of it behind this, this motion, but I think it, you have to consider uh, everything else as well, especially in residential area. I mean, I don't know, I can't, if I want to have uh, garage sales in my house, if I do more than three times, I have to go get a permit for it. <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's, it has to be kind of a fair process. So uh, I'm, I'm kind of concerned about the residential areas as well. Uh, the, the clearance of the sidewalks, if it's a roaming, Roaming vendor, Harvey, and the enforcement is another issue. I mean, the trash, you say that they have to take the trash with them, but if they dump it there, they dump it in the, the trash can. Who's going to enforce? I mean, it's very difficult to, to enforce. Some of these issues are very difficult to, to enforce. Uh, so my suggestion would be to have a, a 15 feet away from the bus stops and the uh, permitted outside dining area. and. Uh, Entrance to, to, to entrances to the businesses, and as far as the insurance goes, I don't know. I, I I think they can sue the city easily if anything happens. But if there are, you know, I take your word that hundred thousand, two hundred thousand is not a problem. I mean, what is what's the cost of having hundred thousand dollars insurance? So I would I'm willing to go with some sort of an insurance, but maybe not a million dollars because if your business is not doing well, it's not easy to cover that. But bear in mind that you're not paying rent, right? And you can't charge them rent? No. For, so that, there you go. It's, it's, it's kind of a, I don't know how, how is it a fair process for, that you use the, the, the city streets and facilities, but you don't pay rent. So if I, I want to go have a birthday in a park, I have to get a permit or pay, pay for that area. And, to reserve that area. It's, it's very counterintuitive, some of the, the laws that we have, so. Uh, but it is what it is. So I'm willing to go with some sort of an insurance. So here, here's my thought. Let me be a little more clear on the insurance aspect. This insurance that we impose on them is to protect members of the public who, I mean, pick a scenario who go and get that hot dog and that hot dog is contaminated and they become sick, or who buy that little glow stick and it busts in their eyes and they become blinded, uh, who take the cart and ram, run over grandma who's, you know, who's trying to cross the street. These are all very um, possible occurrences. And what we're doing is by putting the insurance requirement is protecting our residents to make sure that there's someone they can go after. Um, they certainly can't go after the city. If someone eats a rotten hot dog uh, and gets sick and has a hospital bill, they can't come against the city. Like you said, the city's going to defend it. But this is to protect those people who become injured, damaged, and any property that, that's inflicted. Now, could that reach the million dollar mark? I mean, as a, uh, you know, as a trial attorney, yeah, I can see that easy. Break open one of those little glow-in-the-dark things, get it in a little kid's eye and it becomes blind, that's a million dollars easy right there. I'm not saying we go to a million dollars, but I think we should at least have some sort of modest level of insurance to protect our residents. Otherwise, there's no one that they can go to if there's any uh, negligence or worse con committed by these, by these vendors. Um, that, you know, that's my, th I don't want to keep them out of business, though. Well, but are, I wanna... you, are you asking restaurants for liability coverage? When we open, we give permits to restaurants. We're not doing that. Their landlords do. Their leases, every, every lease well, has well, a We're line. not. The city's not involved in that. But they're not on, the restaurant isn't on the city street. This guy is on our city street. Also, by the way, we have no idea what an insurance company is going to charge a street vendor. Right. I couldn't even begin to I don't know. I don't no, know. It's, think uh, how much Mr. that would be. Mr. Agajani. On the insurance which I offered, 100000 and 200000 is not going to be much. The reason being, for an automobile liability insurance, 100000 300000 it's amounts to nothing, like 600000 
automobile is much more dangerous than street vendor selling something. So it's but not that that's really a pool of millions of people. It's not that, but the few but number ever, of people with that will, we don't know what it's going to yeah, cost. But, uh, just don't. That will also help the vendor themselves to protect themselves. So it's not just for the benefit of general public, but it will help the vendor. And that is an area where we can regulate. It's public health and safety. And what was the other thing? Uh, there was well, the third. welfare. Welfare. I mean, this goes. I don't want to put a vendor out of business. I appreciate their hard work and their entrepreneurship, and you know they're out there taking a risk, buying a day's worth of uh, helados. Is that the uh, proper term? The, uh, the the little ice creams, and he might go bust. He might get a you know a cold day, and, and there's his his whole thing. But I also have to keep an eye out for the public, so that there's someone they can go after in case there's. Um, some injury that they've caused. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to how to balance that. I mean, obviously there has to be some some balance uh, in that. How about the city attorney's office? Can we, you have any suggestions <coughs> on how we can balance those policy issues? Well, uh, one one way was to uh, delegate it to the risk manager. I think if you want, to, yeah, I've heard a range. So I mean, the, the other option is just for the council to get. Set on a range. Obviously, I think all of you didn't feel comfortable with the one million, two million, but something less than the you know, 100, 200, or two, 100, 250. Um, again, it provides that minimum level of co coverage that protects the vendor and also uh, the, you know, the city as a additional insured. Uh, so what if we propose 100,000? 100,000 aggregate of 200,000. It's not going to be much. Yeah, they usually, they usually come together, the single you know, single currents combined. So, but again, I don't know. We don't know how much yeah, that I mean, costs. It's, uh, we're, you know, sort of thinking about what's the worst that could happen, what's the most likely uh, type of uh, event that could occur. Well, so far, we only have one hot dog vendor late at night on Brand Boulevard. So I think we're, we're safe so far. We should ask him to inquire about uh, his liability uh, insurance, because there are no other vendors that I know of, nor has the police reported any vendors anywhere. Can I ask one more question? Yes, uh, the definition of a sidewalk vendor, it says pedal-driven cart, so is this the type of a car that you can, like a little tricycle or you can, so yes. are they allowed to ride those on the on the sidewalk? Not in commercial zones, yeah. So I mean, my understanding is that yeah, anything is sort of like bicycle, sidewalk, uh, skateboard, skating, not allowed in commercial zones. Um, so they would have to probably walk it. Um, but that would be allowed. But they could, if they had a bike, that they'd have to make sure they're not doing that on the on the on the right. Residential way. zones. Um, not sure. Do you know? They're allowed or not allowed? They're. Yeah. Yeah, they, they would be allowed. Can you ride your bicycle in a residential zone? Yes. On a, on a sidewalk. Yes, my, that's my understanding. Yeah, to your side, yes. Okay, okay. I didn't know that, so good to know. All right. Um, so if I may, I just only the only other points I heard were um, the 15 feet distance requirement for bus stops and those types of outdoor dining entrance to businesses, some insurance um, provision, 100,000, 200,000. And then the fee, I could bring it back at 598, and then the council can discuss it further uh, in two weeks, or you can just give us direction now on what that should be. Again, 598 is the top, and anything less is within your within your discretion. Well, she's she mentioned uh, 200 was top, so we might go 250. 200, 250. We have a 200 dollar fee for the first 50 vendors that, that <laughs> pull the permit. And then uh, after that, it goes up. <laughs> <That's an introductory. laughs> we'll hit that on the tenth year of the ordinance. Probably. Unfortunately, no. Uh, but we can't do that. I, I mean, to, I uh, we can reassess as we go, as we start to get, if we get more and it starts to become an issue. But um, I don't think we can have it you know, sort of first come first serve. It's based on it is what it is. Based on not, you know. Why so, we don't make it two ninety five rather than five ninety five? Make it what's our expense? I'm sorry. What's our? That's expense? our expense. Five ninety five. Five ninety five is our 598, expenses yeah. to make it Correct. work. Yeah, that's the staff time to 
you know, review all the data that's being submitted as part of their application. Well, proposed 300, I would, I would support. I'm 295, that's what it was saying. 295, 300. Yeah. I, I was just looking at it as if they have to buy the insurance and then pay the fee, you know, it starts to get up into the, you know, thousand dollar range. Insurance and so I'm thinking, you know. One other question. The, the, the <laughs> permits from health department from the city, are we requiring them to display it somewhere? So Did you hear the question? every, especially if they serve food. I believe, I believe so. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of council. They would be required to show valid Los Angeles County Public Health Department um, certificate. So they have to show some sort of proof. I don't know that they're required to actually show it on their cards, but they do have to submit with their application proof of the um, of the of the permit from the Los Angeles County Public Health Department. Is there a cost on that? I believe there is. I don't know what the cost is, but yeah, 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 but well, welcome to our world. I mean, it's <laughs> just <laughs> you, you do business here. There's cost involved. You can't just. Well, I'm, you know. I'm just thinking. You know, that it keeps adding up for. I know know it's for everybody yeah. else. It's not just. Well. But do they have to display it? So if it's. As written in the ordinance, they do not have to display okay. it. But do they um, have to? They have to show proof upon uh, submission of their application. Okay. Do they have to provide that every year to in order to renew their license? Yes. 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 So the license is once a year. Yes. Okay. And I, I think that should be. I think that should be shown. I think that has to be on, on the cart so people the, know their health, that their health permit. If they yes, stop their health we can make that change as well. There. So people if you have that. it, what's the problem of displaying? Do they get graded? Right. Do we still have that grading system in the county? A, yeah. B, C. I don't know that they get graded. I mean, this is such a new okay. uh, animal. We can look. We can ask. We will ask. I would like to move the item with insurance for hundred thousand per occurrence and two hundred thousand aggregate. The distance I compromise of twelve feet. Don't come from 12 feet, 15, 15 feet. feet. Okay. I just okay. want to move this item. 15. 15. Okay, I will make it 15. And what, what, what was the other item? That, um, that fee. The fee. The fee, 295. Yeah. With the fee of $295. Can we, Mr. City Attorney, can we bifurcate the vote on the insurance limit separate from? You, well, it's part of the same ordinance, so you can, if you if you want, when it comes back for the actual vote, we can take a separate vote on that before the ordinance. So if the council wants to have a vote on it, and then if yay or nay, and then the council can. So we'll, okay, so we're just then, introducing council, it today. Correct. And we'll have then when it comes next. back, when it comes back, when's the vote? Come, when would that be? November nineteenth. Okay. okay. Well, let's do that. We can. We can think about it some more. Yeah, Maybe get good. some information. Right. Can you help us find out what an insurance? Um, it'll be difficult because we can get insurance requirement quotes for us, but we're the city, so it's way different than somebody. But we'll we'll ask and we'll see what State what we'll do. The, the ones that have insurance, the cities that have insurance, okay. we'll yeah. reach out to them to see what just, they're. Just to give us an idea, just for sure. information. Yeah. I will find out about okay. different insurance. Okay. And, and so, so that that's. Uh, did you get the? Yeah. So I just want to make sure the the ordinance is being introduced with the 15 foot distance requirement where it says 10, insurance requirements at 100,000, 200,000, um, and the permit the, fee. The, well, the permits and fees a separate resolution, and then there was a third thing that I can't remember. Oh, yeah, that they permit. display their health permit right. uh, if if they the are selling permit. food on, on right. their on their receptacle. One more item. Can they have like some sort of number on the uh, on this their cart? Cart, like an identification number. Mm -hmm. like, you give them number like, like license plate one or one. Sure. Or we one can make, or make that part of the requirement. The permit. I mean, requirement. they come to get the permit, right? Sure. Mm -hmm. So you give one or one, one or two, or numbers that somebody knows who Council one comfortable one with that? is. Maybe. Yes. Like the yes. automobiles, they have plates, they have numbers, so. Okay. These have to have numbers that wherever they stand, so you know who they are. Well, and and so then if, if someone, uh, if they don't clean up the, the trash or something, and uh, someone can the resident takes a picture and they have the number yeah. of the 
so the card, the so that would be good. Okay, so right. that's in there too. Okay. Yeah. That's in the order. Mr. So Mayor, members of council, I just have uh, I need clarification on the display. The ordinance as written indicates that the vendor has to have in their possession at the time that they're vending um, the food that they have to have their permit. So with the council, um, is the council direction to have it not only in their possession but displayed? Display. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. So we will add that and also the display of the permit. Yep. Permit number. And identifying. Number. identifying yeah. 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 number right. of so the permit. Like will be GL 101, GL something, so they know when they call, says, I have problem with this vendor. Permit GL number one, Because okay. okay. they can't find who the person is, who's their mm -hmm. name is, so it will be very difficult. So okay. the display of the permits is the city permit and the health department permit okay. if they serve food. If they okay. don't serve food, they don't need to have health department. Correct. So. Right. Yeah, and you're, you incorporate all that in your introduction, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. okay. So the yes. ordinance is introduced. Okay. I'll second. No, oh, it's, it's just, just introduced. Second. That's right. Okay. Uh, next item, please. 12 oral communications, five minutes. Discussion is limited to items not a part of this agenda. Each speaker is allowed five minutes. Council may question or respond to the speaker, but there will be no debate or decision. The city manager may refer the matter to the appropriate department for investigation and report. Thank you, Rubik Tarosian. Good evening, Honorable Mayor Najarian, council members and staff. My name is Rubik Tarosian, resident of Glendale for 40 years, over 40 years. Uh, Mr. Najarian um, and council members, uh, with utmost respect, I'm asking you guys uh, to um, itemize um, or put an item on the agenda uh, since uh, five minutes is not enough time uh, for me to bring in detail. Bless you, Mr. Arbiter. Bless you. We're going to be sick tomorrow. This council is going to be out for a week. I think it's the air conditioning. It's the air conditioning. I'm sorry, Mr. No give, give Mr. Tarosian. Start his time over again. All right. We'll restart with Mr. Tarosian. Um, I'm going to make it quick. I just want to ask respectfully from Mayor Najarian and council members uh, to please put an agenda, put an item on, on the agenda uh, regarding certain matters that concerns our Civil Service Commission and the Police Department. I personally think, and I brought it to your attention at least twice, and I know the Chief of Police is standing behind me, that uh, they are abusing their power. And uh, for that reason, I'm respectfully asking you guys to put this item on agenda, they can come from anywhere and they can bring facts to the dais and you can hear me, hopefully it'll be more than five minutes at that time, and I can share with you the concerns that I have that it does concern me at this time and my family, but in reality it would benefit uh, the whole community. Um, the way I was raised, the way I dealt with bullies in my life was different than the way I taught my son how to deal with bullies, and my son is only 12 years old. At this time, again, I'm respectfully asking you, especially Mr. Najarian, because I've checked around, I've spoken with people, and they're saying that um, there are different ways of putting an item on the agenda, and you play a big role on this, uh, um, Mr. Najarian. I'm respectfully asking you again to put this item on the agenda. Thank you very much. Let me ask the city attorney, does the council have any oversight jurisdiction on the Civil Service Commission we can't I mean we can't even remove our commissioners uh, but but no let me just ask I understand what you're requesting my question is is that something that's even in our uh, mr. mayor members of council I'm not certain it's uh, based on the information I have from uh, talking with the chief is that that would be something that would be appropriate for a forum in the public setting in addition, although there is authority as it relates to the Civil Service Commission, um, in some contexts, I'm not sure this applies, and I'm not. We'd have to have a further discussion about whether to agendaize something like that. Have you been briefed? Have you spoken to Mr. Charles, and do you know exactly what he's referring to? And I have. I have a sense. I've spoken to. I've spoken to the chief. Um, I will speak to you. That. I'll speak to you okay. offline, and right. perhaps. Uh, yeah, we should probably have a discussion. We can that. understand what, what's going. on. Mr. Johnson, I just want to share something with you. A few weeks ago, you asked the um, 
city attorney to get in touch with me. A few weeks ago, I brought it to your attention, and I'm still bringing it to your attention, when you asking the question whether he has gotten in touch with me. The answer, straight up, it's no. He has never gotten in touch with me. Now, when he's talking to the chief, the city attorney's job is to protect the city in any way possible. I like to resolve this matter, and I want to do it the right way, Mr. Mayor. That's why I come to this dais to ask you for more than five minutes. And the only way you can do it, or the only way I can do this, if an item is put on the agenda. Thank you. So for everyone out there um, who wants items put on the agenda, um, and I'm not speaking for the rest of the council, but, but we have to understand what the issue is and, and be convinced that this is something that uh, the city can uh, discuss, resolve, and take action on. Um, I don't know exactly what Mr. Trosian is talking about. I'm going to keep an open mind on it, and if I get information that leads me to believe there's something worthwhile for us to agendize and to discuss, then I would have no uh, qualms asking one other member of the council to support me to do that. So uh, thank you for thank you for bringing that forward. Herbert Milano. Good evening, Mayor Nigerian, members of the City Council and City staff. My name is Herbert Molano. I'm going to give you a preview uh, and read to you a preview of uh, a document that I'm submitting to the press. Uh, and I wanted to present it to you with regard to the ordinance that you plan to bring up for your vote on December the 10th. For those of you who, um, the, the title is How Short-Term Rentals Saved Many Homeowners from Foreclosure. For those who lost their homes during the subprime mortgage crisis, the years 2008 and 2009 would scar their memories for the rest of their lives. Nine million people lost their jobs in 2008, and the nation's homeowners suffered 3.1 million foreclosures. As the recession took hold and the economy imploded, three out of work designers at a conference thought up the idea to make some money to meet their own lodging expenses, and in the process, they created a whole new international industry home sharing, and short-term rental vacation rentals using the web. The recession reduced home ownership throughout the United States by over 8 million households, and those lucky enough not to have been installed in toxic mortgages still felt the impact through the loss of jobs, company closures, and lost pensions. According to The Atlantic, 401ks and IRS lost about $2.4 trillion. The average loss to workers who have been on the job for more than 20 years they lost about 25% of their pension. After the recession, during the recovery, other schemes continued. Vulture capitalists brought swaths of neighborhood <coughs> homes at depressed prices. Banks would not renegotiate loans for the people holding the mortgages, but would consider selling them for less than the possible negotiated price to investors who knew how to take advantage of the chaotic system. People lost title to their homes, or who lost them were often offered to stay in their homes for rent, at ever increasing rents and eventually lost their ability to pay those rents as well. But for thousands of homeowners desperate to stay on their homes, there was an opportunity they would never have imagined. They could rent out a spare room or move temporarily out of their homes and rent to vacationers from abroad. Some who would never have accepted the idea of sharing their home with total strangers found that it was not such a bad experience after all. Since many had lost their jobs, being home to host guests from across the country or from Europe took on the opportunity from Airbnb to meet the mortgage and eventually stay in their homes during their retirement years. Short-term rentals was born out of necessity a decade ago and may serve many homeowners as the next likely recession in 2020 if some economic forecasts are correct. Fortune magazine reports that two-thirds of the economists of the National Association of Business Economists predict a recession as a direct result of the President's trade policies. The current trade war with China has already cost 300,000 jobs, according to Moody's Analytics Chief Mark Zandi. 900,000 jobs will be lost as a result of the trade war by the end of 2020, according to his estimates. For many homeowners without an adequate pension, short-term rental may be a solution when no other alternative may be available to them. Aging retirees who have been out of the job market for a long time would be even more heavily impacted. 
The recent introduction by the City Council of an ordinance to ban short-term rentals may remove the last remaining safety net for seniors and underemployed homeowners who desperately depend on that additional income. On December the 10th, the Glendale City Council will be taking up the vote on this ordinance. Let's hope that their memories are not so short-term as they ponder the unimaginable a return to hard economic times for homeowners and now without a safety net. In the process of researching to write this for you and to write this article, I came across this book that came out two weeks ago, it was published, it's called Home Records. This takes off from where the, the implosion ended and venture um, capitalist or virtual capitalist came in and basically started buying swaths of homes and basically create additional havoc to individuals who could have saved their homes. What I hope that the city council uh, consider on December the 10th is that when economic hard times come about and people don't have, still don't have a good pension and they rely on short-term rentals, that these hundreds of people be considered. And I thank you very much. Thank you. I don't have any other cards. Do we have new business? Yes, we do. Who's going to read this? Can I make the motion? I move that the city manager be and hereby is authorized to enter into a retainer agreement with Lieber Cassidy Whitmore to provide legal services in connection with advice and consultation on employment and labor relations matters litigation both in court and public employees relations board and other labor related matters. The city manager or her designee is authorized to enter into said retainer in an amount not to exceed $750,000 for a five year period beginning the 2019-2020 fiscal year. Second. Roll call. Councilmember Agajanian. Yes. Devine? Yes. Carpetian? Yes. Quintero? Yes. Mayor Najarian? Yes. Any other new business? I think that's it. Move we adjourn. We're adjourned.